it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Tonight's story is a prequel to Dead Mall. Listening to it first is recommended, but not vital. Sleepy Pine by Tyler from the Cold Relic series. I'm writing this story in response to another that has recently made its way to the internet called Dead Mall. Now, as unbelievable as it sounds, I think that it's likely that it happened. But I don't know where Mike and Jenna are, and I'm not sure if I can provide any answers as to what transpired at Sleepy Pines Mall in 2013. What I do have is my own first-hand experience from when the mall was still open and fairly busy. Past its prime, yes, but still functioning as a place to shop and be with friends. Right off the bat, I should mention that some of my memories around these events may be unreliable. I do have very good long-term recall normally. I can remember things that happened when I was just two years old. However, these memories were buried and forgotten until recently. I think I should start by talking about how I remember the mall itself. For a long time, I hadn't at all. Not really. I only had vague childhood memories with a fog of confusion, existing in a place where I couldn't be sure if I was misremembering a dream or something real. I always knew that I'd visited multiple times as a kid. We have pictures to prove it. I think I even have a few toys and clothes as keepsakes that we must have bought there. But until I read about Mike and Jenna's exploration of the mall's dying husk, I couldn't recall anything truly solid about my own visits, like the memories were always hiding just above a dark storm cloud. I'd partially blocked out my history with the place because something traumatic happened to me there, and it would have defined my childhood and growth had it been allowed to actively circle around in my mind during those crucial years. Right. Let's start with how innocent my own journey to the past began. Well, the modern classic movie Home Alone had a mall scene. I mean, it did, right? Even now I can't let go of the belief that such a scene existed. Before I take a detour into cursed lost media territory, I'll explain. I first saw the movie in November 1990 when it had just come out. Though I still don't have many clear memories of the showing, even after my mental floodgates were opened. I know I went to the sequel when it arrived as well, but I only ever saw either movie in parts on TV for several years after that. They steadily ingrained themselves as American holiday movie staples. I think I was 12 when I finally watched it in full again, on a videotape we rented for a family Christmas get-together. At an age when it's easier to remember and understand your personal history and the world around you, the fuzzy uncertainty of all things that we have when we're younger goes away so I clearly recollect asking my parents about the mall scene. What? My mum replies, right around the time the bandits start getting tortured by a psychopath kid. Honey, there is no mall scene. Well, I couldn't accept that. I remembered seeing it when we first all went to the film together at the mall in 1990. Probably the only part of the film I could remember pretty well from that viewing in a dark, crowded theatre. As the credits rolled... This time in a living room with a roaring fireplace, I was perplexed. My older brothers and sister called me dumb for getting something wrong about what was clearly one of the most important hallmarks in cinema. Obviously they would, being annoying teenagers. Years later, when DVDs came out, I eventually rented the movie again and watched the deleted scenes included in the extras, certain I'd vindicate myself. My thumb was on my old flip phone's digits, itching to call up my sister, who was in college at that point, just so I could rub it in her face. But the scene never showed up. For some reason, this persistently bothered me much more than it should have. I even talked to my parents about it, and asked them to think really hard about the day we saw it back at Sleepy Pines. Had we seen some rare cut of the film, or was I just losing my mind? The thing is, there was a point in this conversation where they both looked at each other, clearly worried, just for a second. Then they assured me that I was probably thinking of another scene. My young mind back then got it mixed up with other movies, or the experience of seeing it at a mall to begin with. Well, to be fair, there is a part of the movie where Kevin McAllister, while on his own, goes to a store to act grown up and buy some essentials. It's not at all like what I've seen in my head. 
which was more elaborate and featured his entire family. I'd always figured that the segment took place before the infamous pizza dinner that gets Kevin sent to the attic. Kevin's been dragged out to the mall for some last-minute holiday shopping, where his siblings and cousins get all the attention. His mom forgets her credit card, so the dad has to pay for everything. The parents are out of character, acting agitated and impatient, and they end up frightening Kevin almost as much as that childhood nightmare fuel basement furnace. At some point, Kevin stops and looks into a dark hallway. It's some part of the mall that everyone seems to ignore, and camera tricks make it look much more ominous than it should be. The unlit corridor becomes one more thing in the movie that scares Kevin's young mind. And that's it. I was never sure just how long this shopping scene lasted, and I can't recall how it ended. Now this deleted scene that I suppose really does not exist is important to my own story, and how I once perceived what I experienced that day as I grew up. Seeing as how I am telling a story that deserves a proper build-up, I'll start from the beginning. I don't expect everyone to believe that these things really happened, but at least writing all of this down may help me finally move on. It was late November, just before Thanksgiving and Black Friday. Well, not quite as big in 1990 as it got to be later on, the shopping weekend was still the annual main event for businesses back then. Malls across America were ground zero. My parents couldn't stand those sorts of crowds, so our visit to Sleepy Pines that year happened a couple of days before the turkey was served. I grew up in Ohio, and not the American Northeast where the mall existed, but many of my grandparents and aunts and uncles lived there, so I was used to taking road trips with my family several times a year. This time we were spending Thanksgiving weekend with my dad's brother, his wife, and their two kids. My cousins were both a bit older than me and my siblings, the girl being 15 and the boy 17. They were fun to hang out with when I was younger, but by then they were jaded teenagers too cool to acknowledge me. Similarly, my siblings were also separated by two years. My sister was the oldest of us at 13, and as my clothes were mostly her hand-me-downs, I typically showed up in our family photos from those years in t-shirts with outdated 80s cartoon characters staring at the camera. She usually just ignored me, or at least mostly called me annoying. Meanwhile, my brothers, 11 and 9, often worked together to plot up new ways to tease or prank me. I was nearly 8, but still the baby. My parents doted on me when they could, but were so busy with the other troublemakers that they had little time to give me guidance or structure in those days, before my siblings started heading off to college. And so it often felt like I was given free reign and could well, get away with anything. But that also meant that if I got myself into trouble, I'd usually have to get out of it myself. I think that early independence toughened me up, at least a bit more than most kids of that age. Still, most everyone cries the first time they scrape their knee, and the pain and fear aren't so bad with each new injury. I could be as terrified by an unfamiliar experience as any kid. And I'd just get over it fast and be able to face those scary moments head-on should they happen again. I like to put on a brave face against adversity, and that gradually helped me get my brothers off my back once they realised that I wasn't going to be the butt of their jokes anymore. There are some things, though, that you simply can't get over. You either have the fortune to learn how to forget, or you're haunted, and maybe change for the worse. Well, thankfully, I did forget, for a long time, and while it mattered most. As an adult who's gone through other hardships over the years, I can better weather suddenly remembered trauma that's separated by such time and distance. I now reside in Hawaii with my boyfriend. I have a good life and supportive friends, so don't worry about me. I only wish it were possible to go back in time and tell my seven-year-old self that everything will be okay that night. Somehow, I survived it. Though my resurfaced memories are spotty, so I may never be certain of every detail, and I'll do my best to fill in the gap. Shortly after we arrived at my uncle's house on a chilly afternoon dotted with snow flurries, all seven of us kids piled into my parents' minivan. Being the youngest, I was already used to sitting in the back row, and not so much being squished in the middle seat between my sister and cousin for an hour-long drive in a vehicle with barely working heat. Well, it sucks. Nothing starts a big family visit slash shopping day like being thoughtlessly crammed in among kids that are all older than you. 
It feels like you don't exist. But Sleepy Pines, on the outset of the holidays, was a sight for my young eyes. The parking lot was nearly full despite my parents' effort to beat the rush. The mall was packed with shoppers carrying bags full of presents, and the ceiling, walls, and storefronts were decorated immaculately for the season with ribbons and giant candy canes. In the atrium by the fountain and mural was the mall centerpiece for the next month. A big Christmas tree that nearly reached the skylight, covered in more ornaments than my entire extended family would ever own. To think there was a time when most malls in America looked so glorious towards the end of the year. Time lasts longer when you're young, so to me it must have felt like we'd shop for eight hours, but it was probably closer to half that. We went into a dozen clothing stores, along with a couple of shoe and book stores. I know a few places were closed up, but like I said, the mall must still have been at least profitable back then. All of this shopping was boring for me and my brothers. My cousins and sister loved it all and made the three of us wait around while they tried out new threads. None of us had these new things called Game Boys yet, but we were stuck with colouring books and small eight-colour crayon boxes for entertainment while the teenagers had their fashion fun. Once the four adults finally noticed how bored some of us were, we got to visit KB Toys for a whole ten minutes. Being with happy kids our age and getting to see all the shiny toys we wanted for Christmas recharged me and my brother's spirits, at least until the teens started complaining that we were going to run out of time to check out the rest of the important stores, what with a movie coming up. The parents wanted everyone to stick together all day too, So it wasn't like we could split up, with one group doing the monotonous clothes stuff, and the rest of us getting to spend more time at the toy store or arcade. When you get that bored from unending tedium as a youngster, your mind starts to wander and you look for anything at all that might stimulate that need for new information. You may start to notice things that you normally wouldn't, like how surprisingly clean a mall might be. Exquisitely so, in fact. No, seriously... Spend enough time on the floor filling in other people's drawings with coloured wax, and you learn to respect the cleanliness of a carpet. A small detail, the lack of stains in the store carpets, or the flawless wood floors, was always one of those random childhood memories of the place that stuck with me. Even the pillars and tile out in the mall space was perfection, all polished and shiny. It was unusual enough to stand out in my mind. That kind of eye and effort for spotlessness in what was just another middling consumer marketplace in rural America. You wouldn't expect such detailed workmanship in any building that didn't already have gold leafing on anything. Yet somehow, I only ever saw one custodian during the whole long visit. Yes, places have cleaning crews that work at night. But this guy somehow struck me as someone who did everything on his own and liked it that way. Sleepy Pines was the old man's second home, his pride and joy. I just don't know how he would have done it, even if he worked there 24-7. I must have spotted him walking around four or five times over the course of the day, trying his best to sink into the background in his beige uniform. I repeatedly saw him picking up trash on the floor, and he took on this angry scowl in each instance that made him look scary. People passed by and ignored him, He seemed like he was cursing the world and the filth they left behind. There was something else I noticed. There were security cameras all over the place. And this was 1990, when they were often less ambiguous and hiding inside ceiling-mounted domes, so they were easily visible, despite being mounted high up. It didn't feel like the shoppers paid them any attention or cared. Maybe all of the posted smile you're being recorded signs put them at ease. Like this level of security was normal. But, like the custodian, I only ever saw a single patrolling security officer. It was as if they considered their CCTV system enough to keep the place safe and ward off shoplifting. I can remember my younger self thinking that the worst stop of the day was Dillard's, one of the mall's two anchors and a huge department store full of clothes and more. My sister, mom, aunt and cousins must have tried on half the outfit. Meanwhile, the rest of us wandered about the store, and at some point I caught my dad and uncle staring off into space, as if they were contemplating on the chain of events that had led them to spending at least an hour there. The memory that sticks out the most was our visit to the perfume section, 
where one of them remembered that their wife wanted something expensive, fragrance for Christmas. I've never forgotten how the smell there was so intense that my brothers gagged, or that I had a coughing fit which lasted for a while. Oh, and now that I'm writing this out and thinking about the nefarious perfume lady in the dead mole story, I can suddenly see her and her smile again in my mind, along with something else that probably traumatized me. As my dad, uncle, and brothers were all too manly to sample the perfume, I got to be the guinea pig. That large lady must have dripped a half dozen smelly liquids on my wrists before the big, strong men finally picked one. I'm sure my brothers just love that. The planned last stop of the day, at least before seeing home alone, was back at the atrium by the fountain. Santa's chair was set up, but he wasn't around yet. I'm guessing not until December. So I didn't get to sit on his lap and ask for something basic like my own new clothes. But there was one thing that I got to finally do, as a reward for being patient all day. I got to ride on the holiday train ride. For those too young to remember something that might still exist at some malls, but were once more prolific, there used to be miniature trains that ran on a small looping track through a faux winter wonderland. There was a long line, and our movie was starting soon. I think we already had the tickets, but I could tell that everyone else was anxious about getting in on time and finding good seats. This wasn't helped by the fact that my brothers were too old to go on the ride, and got irritated because they had to wait on me. Even though the younger of the two could have gone on it, I vividly recall that at the time he always insisted on acting as grown up as his big bro and wouldn't have ridden it out of principle. Knowing how I was back then, I must have felt guilty about it, like I was doing something selfish. And there was one thing about that mall that really creeped me out. I did so when I first visited the few times when I was very young. It still does when I think back on it. The mural in the atrium by the fountain, the settlers and the natives in the dark woods that once covered the area. Most people didn't seem to mind the artwork or pay much attention to it, but there was something about the people depicted on those tiles, their flat expressions and their eyes that stared off into nothing. The nighttime trees behind them, which did look like they were made by another artist, well, didn't bother me as much. I've heard and read about others' experiences that mention the subtle brushwork in the background depicting mythical and real forest creatures just waiting to be found by astute observers, but I never got close enough to search for myself. I did have plenty of time to bask in the figure's gazes while in line for the train, though. Those eyes were unnerving me by the time I got to the boarding area. To make matters worse, which was the theme for the day, our parents forced my brothers to stand in line with me, even though they weren't riding. It made them even more agitated. When they get like that, I become an outlet. They weren't always mean back then, and we have a good relationship as adults. But when they were having a bad time, they were experts at making me have a bad time too. Teasing, pranking, mocking my age and height, the general ragging. Anyone with older siblings can relate, I'm sure. Typical stuff. I wouldn't bother mentioning it if their behaviour wasn't so important later on. Well, at least I did get to ride the train. Only for a minute or so. Afterwards, we rejoined the rest of the family after they'd moved their purchases to their cars outside while I was in line. We then rushed into the small movie theatre, grabbed some snacks, and because we showed up just as the film was starting and it was crowded, we had to settle for seats in the back row. Oh, my brothers blame me for that, too and they conspired with my sister and cousins to get them peeved as well. I would never tattle or whine to mum and dad, but, well, not about petty things like that, nor did I fight back much. Instead, suffering in silence. I didn't let myself cry either, but it still hurts to get gaslighted into thinking that you're to blame for everything. When I wasn't the one in charge of organising an overstuffed and exhausting shopping extravaganza, the movie provided a distraction from all that, though. I could relate to poor Kevin, being picked on and forgotten, but the idea of getting a chance to take things out on a pair of burglars via elaborate traps was nothing more than cathartic fantasy. The rest of my family probably didn't see the similarities, and to them it was just a comedic holiday film. It was just annoying that I had to get a whiff of those stinky perfumes every time I took a bite of popcorn. 
Afterwards, we had dinner in the food court as a long day came to an end. All of us kids and teenagers were more than ready to go home. Part 2 But then, Mom suddenly needed to buy just one more thing. With only a few minutes until the mall closed at 7, we had to make a final stop because she remembered that we needed a new vacuum cleaner to replace our broken one. I lived with my immediate family in a rural area that was far from any department stores, so squeezing in such a purchase made sense, even if it made the younger ones more irritable. With all of our many other purchases already sitting out in the freezing parking lots, we made a mad dash to Sleepy Pine's only other anchor store. Still not sure just how my parents managed to fit their new vacuum into the van with everything else. They must have taken care of all their holiday shopping in one day. Turned out that the other kids really didn't like this last-minute decision. My sister and cousins don't always make me into their plaything, a stress ball, hunch pillow, but when pushed far enough, they'll get in on the action too. After their pleas to get home fell on deaf ears, meaning that TV shows will be missed and nightly calls to high school boyfriends will be delayed. They turn their eyes to me for entertainment, right in the middle of Sears. I'm sure I quickly reached my limits on putting up with their crap and got pretty upset. But the adults were too busy trying to buy an appliance just before the mall closed to pay us any attention. Again, I do have a good relationship with my cousins and siblings in the present, I swear. Even bad children can turn into good adults. Just important for story purposes to mention the ridicule I experienced. Though to be honest, it does feel great getting to call them out for it after all these years and to subtly blame them for everything that happened next. You see, I did stupid things as a kid too. Inexplicable things at times. That's what happens when you're young and lack critical thinking skills, and the idea of consequences is still hard to grasp. I was coming from a place of logic when I did it, but that didn't make it even close to the right decision. To try and get away from their bullying, I'd been walking around the nearly empty Sears store at a faster and faster pace. But the others kept up, and it only turned it into more of a game for them. Then an opportune moment arrived when my dad and uncle started calling for everyone to come back. Not because mum was ready to make the final purchase and free us, but rather, well, parents just don't like it when the kids are out of sight for too long. But I knew it was only a matter of seconds before my tormentors wandered off again from the vacuum cleaner aisle to renew the pursuit. So instead of going to the adults with them, I turned around, ran to the major appliance corner of the store, and crawled into a washing machine. Yeah, not my best moment. But you couldn't beat it as a hiding place. And back then, we didn't have all the safety features we now take for granted, so it was easy to close the door from the inside. So there I was, hunkered down in a pitch-black tumbler, more scared of my family than my hideout thought about getting out within the first minute. Then I heard someone walking past and figure it might be one of the older kids. I stayed in there. I must have lost track of time. To be fair, it was the first bit of true peace and quiet I'd known all day. Well, according to the old memory of this incident that I never used to question, the next thing I knew, I'd gotten out, wandered about the empty Sears for a bit, was then helped out of the store by some cops and returned to my parents amid the flashing lights of the police crews. But I never had a firm grasp on the passage of time around the event. And now, I remember why. Much more actually happened. First, I should note a peculiar observation which never left me about the end of that day. During the last 15 minutes or so, before the 7 o'clock closing time, I'd noticed the behaviour out in the rest of the mall from the Sears entrance. Employees were closing up their shops in a hurry and rushing customers out, not even at all that politely. In turn, the owners and workers I could see looked like they were being directed by the general mall staff to hurry things along, the custodian and head of security guys being among them. This also happened much closer to me, moments later in the department store, just before my siblings and cousins started being mean. There was a conversation between my parents and, for aunt and uncle, with the employee helping them pick a vacuum cleaner that's always stuck out for me. And it went something like this. I'm very sorry, but we're going to have to make this quick. 
A parent asked, What's the rush? We know you close at seven, but... Yes, but this evening we need to be out of the store within just a few minutes after closing. Has it always been like that? My uncle or aunt replied. We've been here before and we've never seen them all like this. The shop has been hurried out. Well, if customers need a few extra minutes to finish up. Further discussion must have seemed like a waste of time to the worried sale associate. And he said something like, It's like this once a year. We can get in a lot of trouble if we linger around tonight. I remember him looking away as he revealed this, or seeing guilt on his face, like this wasn't something he was supposed to say to customers. It was odd, but seeing as how this was also the first time I'd ever been at a mall at closing, I probably just figured that this was the way things were. But later on, as a teenager in the 90s, I hung out malls often with my friends and it was usually a pretty lax affair as things closed down. You normally just finished whatever you were doing and left as the stores rolled down their shutters. Things got quiet, lights turned off, and the place emptied out. But my parents didn't dwell on it for long, because it was easy to come up with a reason and explain the rush and shrug off the urgency. I think it was my mum who replied, Oh, it must be because of the holiday weekend. Of course. Well then, I'll just have to make my choice quickly. I didn't get to see which vacuum cleaner she chose until I was safely back home. Yes, obviously I did survive that night. It shouldn't have been a night where that was ever in question. Now that the memories have come back to me, I've only just begun to wonder about the scars it left behind. I think a part of my subconscious has been haunted by what I experienced, even while the rest of me managed to forget for the longest time. Mum sometimes says that I was different before the night I got left in the mall. What my family believed happened would have been enough to traumatize any kid that young. But the whole truth is just so far beyond what they know. I've delayed writing out what transpired long enough. There's nothing left to set up in the story. Revisiting and really processing everything has given me the shakes these past few weeks. So I might have some sort of PTSD thing going on. But I'm going to try. I don't expect you to believe the second part of this story, and that's fine. Maybe if just one person does, and they're the right person, I could finally get some answers. But I doubt they exist. When I snapped out of whatever state of mind I was in and left that washing machine, I stepped into a very dark Sears store. It was almost winter and already dark outside, and the place had no lights on at all meaning my only source of illumination came from the parking lot lights outside and what little was still running out in the mall. It was very empty and very quiet too. I didn't want to believe that my family would just leave without me. I must have thought that they'd come looking or someone knew where I was. Maybe the reason I stayed in the tumbler for so long was simple kid logic. I was expecting someone else to find me and let me know that it was time to go. I just had to stay put and safe from my tormentors until the adults came and saved me. I ran up to the door to the parking lot, hoping it would open and I'd see the van running outside with with mum or dad ready to open the sliding passenger door for me and asking, What took you so long? But the lot was as vacant as the store. You could mistakenly think that the mall hadn't been visited in years, the way a landscape once filled with vehicles appears. The doors were also locked, to no surprise. Not that I was stupid enough to venture out into the cold, only dumb enough to hide in a washing machine. It occurred to me early on that the mall was going to be closed until Friday, so I might have taken that to mean that absolutely no one would enter the building before then. This realisation upset me. Chances are I shed a few tears, but I would have also been brave and tried to focus and reach out to reason. I knew my aunt and uncle's home phone number, All I needed to do was find a phone. I could get quarters from the fountain for a payphone if I needed to, and I knew that there should be plenty of phones around the store as well. Not that I would have known what it meant to get an outside line on any of them. But calling out was a moot point anyway. I did locate some phones as I explored the back offices and found the one at the customer service desk. Nothing had a dial tone. Figuring I was doing something wrong, all the store shut them off at night. I left the relative safety of Sears to try and make my way to a payphone. Whereas the store felt somewhat safe, 
despite being a left-behind seven-year-old in the dark. Even today, the idea of walking around in an empty mall at night freaks me out. I may not fully get the liminal spaces craze, but there is something universally unnerving about exploring some place typically full of people that you're never supposed to see after closing. The Sears wasn't blocked off by a rolling shutter I'd have no hope of getting open, like most of the stores. All that kept me inside were a pair of latches on the top and bottom of glass doors. I found a stepladder so I could reach the upper lock and got out in minutes. Scared and shaking, yes, but rather proud of my handling of the situation so far and ready to find a payphone. Being an hour from the house meant rescue would take time, but just hearing a parent's voice would have been enough for my spirits at that moment. The mall itself was better lit than the Sears, though not by much. It was a dark and cloudy evening, so the skylights were pitch black. But what was coming from the vending machines and any storefront signage that had backlighting provided me enough to navigate by. While the darkness was bad enough, it was a silence that really got to me. Most people probably feel that the sprawling indoor shopping plaza playing its crappy muzak at night would only add to the creepiness and I might have found it rather comforting in comparison. My sneakers squeaking against the tile, I kept otherwise quiet on the watch all around me. My eyes peeled on the shadows as if expecting a monster to jump out at any moment. I didn't take long to find a couple of payphones, but they didn't have dial tones either. That must have dampened my outlook. I think I shrunk down against the wall and had another good cry. At some point, I noticed a warm, flickering light down the hall, towards the atrium. God, was the mall on fire? It would have been a frightening discovery at first, like something out of a strange nightmare. But I didn't see any smoke or hear any alarms going off. There could have been someone down there, some member of the staff who was either fighting the flames or had ignited them. I wiped my tears and approached cautiously. As I turned the corner, I saw the first of that night's bizarre scenes. Dozens of candles lined the inactive fountain. There was a thin sheen of some kind of dark liquid on the water that had an acrid odour. The image of the mural now stands out vividly in my mind. The dancing candlelight on the faces of those colonists and the natives ceding the land to them. There was something old world about it, like a part of the past was lingering in this place. That's when the chanting reached my ears. It was distant, but I could tell it was coming from real people. There was only one more way to go. It was the Dillards at the other end of the V-shaped mall. I looked around the next corner, and under a larger skylight were a number of figures, sitting on the floor and surrounded by four load-bearing pillars and countless candles. The people were in silhouette and difficult to see, but they were people. Now, call me judgmental, but I wasn't naive enough to believe that a group chanting in candlelight near a polluted fountain in a mall at night would offer to help a child who may have already seen too much. Even so, I kept still and stuck to the shadows, watching from a distance for a short while. My young mind must have had no idea what to make of the sight. Was this something adults typically got together and did after work? Were they practicing for some kind of holiday performance? It sounds ridiculous even to consider these things now, of course. When you're a kid whose worldly experiences are limited, every new discovery can mystify, no matter how mundane. I should mention how well I can remember this part. I've always been able to, but I just couldn't recognize it as something that really happened. I'll explain why later. But I figured I should preface the clarity I have of this moment. Now, over the course of several minutes... I'd snuck closer to the group, only stopping and hiding behind a fake plant once I could make out their strange chanting. It was in harmony among the seven people and oddly rhythmic, if not muffled by their masks. Their mantra was paced like breathing, in and out and muttered in a low drone. And it only consisted of two words that I'd never heard before, words that I knew did not belong to the English language. Well, I can best translate their pronunciations as Yoga de Ade, followed by Hadu Niye. Candlelight was too dim to make out their clothing at first. 
but their animal masks were easier to discern. There was a rat, a raccoon, some bird of prey like an eagle or hawk, a fox, a deer, and a snake. The person leading the incantation wore a pig mask, and if everyone was positioned on a clock, he would have been at midnight, with the others at three, four, five on one side, and seven, eight, nine on the other. There was no holding of hands, no movement or swaying, like they were in a meditative trance, saying those two words without thought or end. There was also a source of light in the middle of the group, but I couldn't make out yet, as three of the people blocked my view. It was a scarlet glow, and it stretched their shadows across the mall tile. I realised as I watched this strange spectacle that I actually might have had some frame of reference for what I was seeing. The time surrounding 1990 was the height of America's satanic panic, which was, in essence, baseless concern among religious communities that Satanism and other forms of pagan worship were prevalent in all walks of life across the country. In other words, a few people were convinced that their neighbours could be trying to summon demons in suburbia. My parents weren't religious, and I never went to church growing up. I can objectively say that it was nothing more than a form of mass hysteria. Back then, I wouldn't have been sure, or not so sure, what it all meant. The panic only being something I'd heard about from my classmates at school, and occasional reports on the nightly news. But I did have some idea of what such a ritual might look like. It didn't matter whether or not I believed in any of it. If the people chanting in a circle truly did, then who knows what they may have been capable of doing, no matter how misguided. Too much faith and conviction in any belief can give people the power to do and justify almost anything. Having convinced myself that they were trying to open a portal to the place where bad guys went, I didn't want to take a chance on any of that stuff being real. And so, I started backing off, deciding to avoid the area entirely. I mean, think about seeing something this messed up as a world-weary adult. Then imagine seeing it as a child. Surreal, inexplicable, nightmarish, the type of thing that would probably never leave your mind. I'm surprised I stayed and observed as long as I did. But, looking back, it may have been because something was pulling me in, tugging at me from a distance, trying to whisper in my ear. Only it was too far away, so its touch was too subtle to quite reach me. I was about to leave, until I heard a familiar sound. The ring of a phone. I hadn't seen it until the big man got up and went over to it. But there was a phone on the floor next to the ritual site. My eyes had adjusted to the dark enough to see and follow the long cable connected to it, which ran from some place further down the hall that I couldn't see from my position. As the pig man went to answer it, I got a look at his clothes. He was wearing a business suit of all things, and it was stained in a deep red. Yes, he said into the receiver, in a plain voice as if he were talking to a regular person on a normal day. Yes, we're ready. Understood. We'll begin right away. And a good weekend to you as well. Goodbye. He hung up, and his other animal mask friends waited patiently as he walked off down the hall. I couldn't take my eyes off of the phone. That was the only one in the mall that was working. There was no way I'd ever be able to make myself sneak over to it. But I knew if I could follow the cord, I might find other usable phones near where it was plugged in. Part 3 The pig man returned after a few seconds, pulling over a trolley cart, like the kind used by ice cream vendors around the mall during the day. This is where things got unexpectedly disgusting and perverse. He opened the sliding metal lid of the cart and pulled out an animal carcass. I think it was, I suppose appropriately, a pig, although its head was missing. And no, thankfully he wasn't wearing it. It was easy enough to tell that what he had adorned was a simple rubber mask, not that it made any of what I was seeing less bizarre. The carcass had already been slashed multiple times, with deep wounds going across the body that were still leaking blood. As if this was just another typical Wednesday for them, he nonchalantly stabbed the pig with a large knife 
to create another exit wound for more blood to flow from, and dangled the carcass over the ritual site. He also shook it around, making the crimson liquid splash across the tile. The other people just kept sitting there throughout, not even reacting. I'm sure they were hit by blood droplets, but didn't care at all. When the pig was thoroughly drained, he chucked it off to the side, and then returned to the cart and pulled off an object that had been perched atop the retracted umbrella pole. When he brought it into the light, I could see that it was a cow skull with horns intact. It was bleached, dusty, and cracked. It had been around for a while. The big man returned to his spot and held it over his head. Fresh blood and old bone, binding our cycle of life with those that have come before. We ask that you hear us once more. This sacred ancient land, we respect your bounty. We know our desires to be worldly and petty, small and meaningless in the eyes of the timeless earth around us. We humbly beg your forgiveness for our sins, for forsaking and abusing nature, and for the death and destruction brought by our forefathers. May the old spirits of those who truly tended to and respected this land only know paradise. They did not deserve our wrath against them, and surely their use of your great power was modest and just. But now we live in a modern world, we know it to be a shallow, frivolous place. And yet our livelihoods are, as always, at stake. Failure of our crops, famine and pestilence may no longer be of grave concern. We still fear failure and destitution, the loss of opportunity. If we do not succeed, then someone even worse than us will. It will be as if we were never here. The pig man lowered his arms and cradled the cow skull could be that his arms were just tired, as he wasn't yet done with his diatribe and requests to what must have been some unseen personal god. Capitalism has swept across this land and carries with it many sins, but our greed is not in excess. For all of its faults, the industrialized world brings benefits to our health and standards of living, but it requires constant economic growth. So we ask that you bless us with one more year of your generous gift. We are caretakers of a structure that has brought in income to many, and joy to far more. We are proud to remain independent, not under the thumb of corporate tyranny. Yet, and God knows we've tried, our slow decline continues. Were it not for your charity, our time here would have already come to an end. We heartily ask that you renew and revitalize our beloved enterprise again. Allow it to persist, and may our days remain full of purpose for as long as you see fit. We cannot be abandoned or forgotten, or bow to those who would dispose of us for profit. Look into our history. See how we are cherished by the masses. And now, my friends, let us pray. With that, he set the cow skull into the middle of the circle, and the chanting resumed, louder and more forceful this time. They continued like this and remained still, like they were meditating. I thought that their eyes must have been closed, and their mantra was boisterous enough to hide any sounds I might make. It was the right time to get moving, to follow that phone's cord and maybe earn a chance to make a call. I know you're probably wondering just how I remember all of this so well. I've actually more than memorized the pigman's words. They've been a part of me for decades, lingering and repeating in my dreams and thoughts. While I had until recently forgotten the context of that ritual, what came before and after, the scene has persisted in my mind since I first witnessed it. It's an unnatural memory, one that could have eventually driven me crazy if I didn't get my answers. Why did I have so many nightmares about it? Why would I think about the pigman's speech while trying to focus on schoolwork? or during sleepovers with friends, or while busy with every other aspect of growing up. The ritual didn't feel like something that had really happened, so I could never explain to myself just where it was coming from or what any of it meant. I've written those words on composition book journals and in text files on computers many times over the years, just to test my memory. I've gotten them exactly the same on each attempt. It's like they're burned into my head. 
no less likely to decay than an ancient language inscribed on stone tablets. That's the whole thing behind all of this. It's our memories. It wants to survive through them, to persist and be rebuilt. The rituals, the personal beliefs, how you view the process, even what you make it out of, doesn't care, as long as it exists in some form and you can give it power. It will bend reality for you and fulfill the closest things this world has to a wish. But the cost? Well, I'm not sure yet what it is. Don't know if it has a name, or if it's even aware of what it is, or how old the thing is, or who created the first one. Talking about the totem. An object bound to this land, whether it can be called cursed or hallowed. I didn't see it the first time I walked past it. Not that I can remember. Maybe I did, but in my memories it's nothing more than a burning bright light, like a hole in celluloid that the projector shines through. As I snuck around the seven worshippers, if that's what they could be called. I got my first real look at their ritual site. Other than the cow skull and the fresh pig blood spatters, I could see that there had been a circle on the ground also made of blood, smeared messily across the tile. Dotting that circle were seven smaller halos for the participants to sit within. In the centre of it was the totem, though, as stated, I only remember it at this moment as a bright flare a burning ball of fire too luminous for the mind to imagine or process. Was there? My eyes must have seen its true form, but I can simply not picture that form in this instant. I hurried around the corner and began to make some distance from the animal mask people, feeling safer with every step. I followed the cord connected to the red phone on the floor into a side hallway, and then to the mall security room, which was empty. It was a small place, little more than a couple of desks and an array of black and white TV screens. They must have been connected to cameras across the building, but all of the monitors were off. I don't think the CCTV system was active during the ritual, ensuring there was no record of it. The very long phone cord was plugged into a jack by one of the desks, and the other desk had a phone resting atop it, just waiting to be used. I knew it had to be working, so I reached out to check for a dial tone. But then it rang. I froze up. I wasn't expecting it to ring, and I was too scared to answer it. What if it was the same person that the pig man had talked to? Or maybe it was someone who could help me, but in my panic state, I just wasn't sure what to do. I hesitated and stood in place too long, and by the third ring I could hear approaching heavy footsteps from someone who must have been wearing boots. I hid under the desk, making myself as small as I could. The light in the room was positioned in a way so that it cast the man's shadow on the nearby wall. Between the phone's rings, I could hear his muffled breathing from under his mask. He sounded agitated, perhaps offended by this interruption. My heart beating out of my chest, I remained under there, quiet and frozen, as he stood just behind me on the other side of the desk. I believe he was waiting for the phone to stop ringing. But after about a dozen or so rings, I could see his shadow bring up his mask and then grab the receiver. Sleepy Pine Security, he answered, in that kind of tone of voice I remember my parents using whenever we did something bad. Yet they were really trying hard not to yell at us just yet. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but he went on to say something like, Lost child? No, no one's here. Yes, I'm looking at the cameras right now. You don't need to get the police involved. Your kid isn't here. Goodbye. Don't call back. He then slammed the phone down. I could hear him mutter out a frustrated, oh, Damn it. Despite my terror, I could still comprehend that it was one of my parents that had just called. They knew I was missing. It was just a matter of time until either they or the police would show up. I suppose it was a good thing that I didn't pick up the phone, or I would very likely have been caught. The pig man slid his mask back down and turned to leave, and I planned to return the call as soon as he was gone. The instant I began to move, however, the phone rang again. I retreated back under the desk only seconds before the pig man came stomping back in. He ripped the phone right off its cord and threw it at the wall with such force that I could hear its plastic casing shatter on impact. His rage only made me more scared of getting caught. 
The slightest inconvenience getting in the way of his ritual was like heresy. Worse, he knew there was a child somewhere in the building, a helpless interloper. He and the others would now keep an eye out for me. Recognizing this, I must have stayed under that desk for a decent length of time before mustering the courage to get up and leave the room. With the only phone I could easily get to destroyed, but also armed with the knowledge that help was on its way, I saw my best option as just trying to get out of the building. Sleepy Pines was at a central location and served many towns, yet it was still away from the interstate and the gas stations near it. The place was in the middle of nowhere, and there were no other businesses I could run to. Even so, by then I was ready to take my chances waiting or hiding outside. The emergency exit doors out in the hall were also a no-go, however. Looking back, I think that the mall could be completely locked down by design. Maybe it was important for the ritual that nothing could get in or out. Or, well, it could be, they were keeping something else inside. I haven't mentioned this yet, but ever since getting out of the washing machine that night, I felt like I was being watched, as if eyes were on me the moment I stepped into the darkness of the Sears store. I wonder, if I'd just stayed in the tumbler, would I have been safe? I'm not saying that the mall itself was alive, but I believe there was some kind of presence in there that night, all around. Pervasive, lingering in the shadows, and in every corner where light didn't reach. The feeling was never stronger than when I slipped into the utility corridor, its entrance being right by the useless emergency exit. It was a cold, dirty place, left unheated. Nothing but grey concrete, wiring, air ducts, old equipment and remnants of stores that had closed over the years. The long stretch of hallway was like the building's unseen museum. Cell signs, going out of business banners, cardboard stands, broken shelving units. I'm not sure what the places that no shopper typically sees are like in your typical mall, but here it was as if the management never threw away anything. Ah, oh, it was a mess, but at least the flickering fluorescent lights that lined the ceiling kept it from being dark. I'm guessing they were rarely turned off. Never actually got the chance to look for some seldom used doorway back there, though. I didn't even take a step past the entrance. The presence I'd felt was almost overwhelming from my spot at the end of a hallway. Any kid would be scared to navigate in normal times, and for one reason in particular. The corridor was breathing. The night still gets worse, but I'm confident that just being in that hall was one of the main reasons my mind locked me out of the surreal memories in the first place. Like the chanting under the skylight, the breathing was rhythmic and natural, in and out as if I was staring into a huge monster's throat. It was frigid, too, but impossible to mistake for a drought. Wind pulled trash and other loose objects away from me, and then blew them back several seconds later. Yet there was no sound other than the skittering of small debris affected by the current. No rumblings or snoring, only dead, silent, breathing air. I don't remember how long I stood there, debating whether it was safe to turn back or actually proceed into the hallway. Maybe only seconds, but I'm sure it felt longer. My decision was made for me when I suddenly saw a rapidly approaching darkness from the other end. This movement was swift and never stopped. It wasn't like the fluorescent lights were taking turns shutting off. There was an abyssal blackness coming right at me at the speed of a train. It engulfed everything it swept over. I think it may even have generated a shockwave of air, hitting with enough force to push me forward just after I turned to flee from whatever entity was threatening to swallow me. I threw my body against the door I'd stepped through only moments ago, before the darkness could reach me. I fell to the floor, stumbled about, and took off in the opposite direction as fast as I could go. Keeping it all in was impossible. I can recall screaming as I ran away with no destination in mind didn't matter that my panic had given myself away, because the pig man was already on the lookout for a child. He grabbed the back of my jacket the instant I passed the corner, where he had been waiting. He was tall and strong. I think he must have picked me up with one arm, by just the collar of my outerwear. 
He brought me up to his mask, and I could see nothing but black through the rubbery pig face's eyes. Well, he muttered in a guttural growl, what brings you to Sleepy Pines tonight, young lady? Able to hold and carry me with a single arm over his shoulder, like he did the pig carcass, he took me towards the ritual site. My survival instincts kicked in, and remembering what my parents had taught me to do if I should ever be grabbed by a stranger, I started thrashing and yelling in his grip. Not that it did me any good against such a brute. Right, I, um, I need to take a break here. I don't feel prepared to move on to what happened after that just yet. It'll take another round of stealing my nerves to revisit the next part. I do want to keep writing while these memories are fresh. I think I'll spend the next couple of nights doing a little research and getting down to some objective facts. Now, pardon the brief interlude. Part 4 During its existence from 1973 to 2008, Sleepy Pines only ever had two owners, the first of which also helped design the building. The second owner was brought in to oversee a revival attempt starting in 1991, but didn't quite succeed and ended up closing shop less than two decades later. As far as I can tell, he was a typical businessman of little importance, and his only noteworthy accomplishment was getting a good deal on the sale of the land. And so... Let's instead talk about Piers Colchester, the first proprietor. I did what I could on digging up information about him before writing this story, but it's no easy task. Whether the world simply ignored him as much as an owner of a mall could be ignored, or he tried his hardest to bury his tracks, his legacy has been made enigmatic. But there are a few things we do know. He was born in 1942, he appeared to be quite tall when compared to others in what few photographs of him exist, and was once a college professor in the northeast of all things, teaching a class on anthropological studies as they pertain to the native populations that once thrived in the area. And that only lasted a short while. Sometime around 1970, he inexplicably came into a lot of money, quit his job and bought a large tract of woodland not far from the freshly laid interstate road. His business dealings were seen as shady, and his construction contracts are seemingly lost, but all of that was brushed aside by the local government when Sleepy Pines opened in 1973 and brought a cash flow into the area that was little more than farmland and abandoned steelwork. I'm certain I met him that night, because he suddenly disappeared in 1990, and a new owner had to be found who wasn't as successful with running the place. The mall's reputation for being clean and safe was hit hard, then it fell into disrepair, vendors evaporated, and its glory days became a memory. In other words, I was there the moment its slow death spiral started. There was something else notable about Sleepy Pines that I gathered from a series of small articles over the years written about the place. Stories and observations that never gained wide attraction, and it persisted while Mr. Colchester was in charge. Excluding the workers who ran both the corporate stores and smaller, independent outlets, the mall had been knowingly understaffed during his tenure. It did function as any other decent mall, only with far fewer people at the helm than usual, to the point where it was noticeable to anyone looking. It managed to thrive in the early days, even so, and that small overhead must have bolstered the monetary success of Sleepy Pines and put more money right in Colchester's pocket. He only ever commented directly on the matter once, and never in a written interview. After contacting a few people I grew up with and who still live in the area, one of them managed to uncover an old videotape with recordings of local news broadcasts from the closest city to the mall. It so happens that Colchester was interviewed in 1988, right in the atrium itself and in front of the mural. He'd made one of his rare public appearances for what was little more than a fluff piece celebrating the mall's 15th anniversary, and the segment was less than two minutes long. Hearing him speak was what really confirmed to me his identity. He's standoffish and his answers are to the point, if not a little defensive. Oh, I won't transcribe the whole thing, but his responses are worth a mention. He's asked three questions. The first, he explains his more success on keeping a small but dedicated and professional staff on hand at all times. 
For them, the place is more than just their livelihood. It's their sanctuary. His words, not mine. Even the reporter seemed a little taken aback by this degree of reverence. Perhaps thinking that he'd gone too far, he visibly tries to lighten up a little and emphasises that he just wants to turn them all and the work around it into an art form, something to take pride in, like the Italians and the Japanese do. Now keep in mind, this is a middling shopping centre in a low to middle class rural area. He definitely thinks too highly of himself, and it's clear that he isn't much for socialising. Replying to a follow-up question on why he'd hired so few people, he claims things like efficiency and forming a tight-knit family. I think he just wanted to save money, have the right number of workers that he felt he could control, either keeping them devoted to his cause or leaving their numbers small so they wouldn't consider rebelling against him. After some banter back and forth and compliments from the reporter about the pristine nature of the place, she asks her final question about the mural. The camera pans over to it, basking in the daylight from the windows above. And because of the low-res video, it's like the figures are watching several children passing by who have ice cream cones in their hands. Every mall needs a centerpiece, something that defines and speaks for it, Colchester said. I've visited many across the country and seen things from elephant sculptures to meaningless displays whipped up by a commercial artist. I had this mural commissioned to pay homage to the people that were here first. It allows us to look back at them, and them us, from the distant past. For anyone that studies the brush strokes closely enough, they will find little secrets. Fictions of folk stories and forest creatures. I cannot give away the name of its two creators, one did the backdrop, the other the deceptively simplistic figures. But suffice to say, they are both modern masters. All this talk of art goes over the reporter's head, and she concludes the interview with a toothy grin and wishes Colchester luck in the next holiday shopping season. Himself an artist in backhanded wit, he smiles wryly and suggests that she might wish to check out the sale at the pottery barn. He cheerfully closes out, we return to the local newsroom to learn of other trivial matters. Oh, I do miss the simplicity of that time. It's hard to believe that just a couple of years later, that man was covered in blood, wearing a pig mask, and returning to what was pretty much a cult ritual in his moor with me in tow, kicking and screaming. I can really only owe my survival to a rift among his workers. Some of them hadn't lost their humanity quite yet, and seeing their boss dragging over a small girl to a sacrificial circle was a step too far for them on first sight. Since I was again near their holy object, I can revisit my recurring nightmare realm where my memories are crystal clear. I was finally close enough to the site to see the others, and I took in their appearances despite being terrified. While they never took off their animal masks, the rest of their clothing was also business attire, and I recognised two of the uniforms, that of the custodian and the head of security, both of whom I'd seen earlier in the day. There were two other men in suits, and two women as well, that I know I'll never identify. For some reason, when I was brought close enough to the object in the middle of the circle, I could see it. Or, more accurately, I can remember seeing it since from then on, doesn't seem to burn a hole in my memory. The totem radiated a strange energy, its structure glowing and containing something exotic and prodigious. There was a red orb floating inside of it, giving off waves of heat like a road on a hot summer's day. I don't think its colour actually had anything to do with blood. Rather, that was just how these delusional people perceived it. Nor do I think they dug it up. It was too clean and intact to be some ancient lost relic found in the area. I believe they built it. I was able to watch the Mike and Jenna videos after getting in touch with the person who discovered their camera files and is keeping them otherwise private, making me one of the few who has watched those mall exploration clips. This was definitely not the same totem that briefly appears in their video. Its composition, size and materials are totally different. Whereas the object they stumbled upon was tall and looked like a wood carving, this 1990 iteration of the supernatural device was made of bone bound by leather to wood, and in a shape similar to an antique hourglass, 
with the bone twisting around to form a cage of sorts that kept the crimson sphere inside. Thankfully, I doubt it was made of human bones. They looked like they come from a large animal, and I don't think that the people were macabre enough for that kind of defilement. Well, not yet. Some of their arguments made their opposition to what was happening clear and gave me hope. But that night was already one of the most demented things a child could ever experience. Other than Mr. Colchester, the pig man, I can't be sure of who spoke because of the masks. Their quarrel went something like this. Why is there a kid in the mall? Where did you find her? We have to stop everything at once. She isn't part of the process. Ah, but she's already seen too much. No, we can medicate her. Knock her out. She'll think this is all a bad dream. Her parents must already be on the way. Don't waste time debating. But you know, it doesn't let anyone forget. This is true, Colchester tells his flock as I continue to stare in awe and fear at their sacred object. And her family is looking for her. But isn't it obvious what we must do? This is a sign. The divine miracle is testing us, our devotion, by bringing us this lost lamb. You know what has to be done. Sir... One of the women replies shakily. When you use language like that, it concerns me. The icon is remarkable, yes, but we need to remain rational and clear-headed. We agreed years ago that it would be dangerous to place such blind faith in this thing that we still don't understand. This remark angers Colchester, and he roars almost incoherently. That is exactly why its power has waned. You never truly believed in the icon. None of you did. Not like I do. How can you take this child's appearance in any other way than as a pronouncement? No, a a holy commandment. You're never going to sacrifice a child, the other woman says, as she and the custodian get to their feet. This, this is too much. When does it end? What's next? The custodian asks his boss. We put two kids under the knife next year, then double it every year after. Ah, if we must, Colchester rages on. Think of all the happy families, making memories, buying presents for their loved ones. We need that to persist. This is a small price to pay for success. Open your eyes. But he is only losing followers, and everyone but one of the men in a fancy suit stand up to oppose him. Well, I don't think its power has weakened, sir, the head of security replies harshly. I think that even it can't keep the tide back any longer. Yeah, he's right, my friend. A man agrees. We can't fight where the market is going. The golden days are over for many businesses, not just us. Let's calm down and talk civilly. There are other uses we can find for this object, and Sleepy Pines may still be able to sustain itself for years to come, even without its help. The path isn't worth holding on to, not at this price. None of you ever had enough faith in our blessed icon. If you truly devoted yourselves to it, we would not even be here tonight. This was when the last person still sitting on the floor, one of the men wearing a business suit and hidden by the rat mask, stood up. He took out the knife from the pig corpse nearby, wiped off the blood on his sleeve. My faith is still strong, he grumbled in a harsh tone. Good, then show me. Colchester demanded, and turned with me still in his grasp so I could face the large butcher's tool. The man in the rat mask approached callously, like he had nothing at all to drive that blade into a child's heart if it meant another year in the black. But the others still wouldn't let it stand, and they drew near. They recoiled when the rat man slashed the knife toward them and said sternly, Get back. I have too much riding on this place. If you can do it, I will. Ever since my mind opened up and confirmed to me that the memories at the ritual site were real, I found myself wondering the most about the Rat Man, more so than Piers Colchester. Who he was, what he had on the line, and why he was the most devoted of the followers. He must have disappeared too. I think they all did, but the others were just less newsworthy. Whatever his story, the group didn't hesitate a second time, and as soon as he had his guard down... They rushed both him and Colchester and wrestled me from their grip. 
From the floor I heard them scuffling, maybe even fighting in earnest. It had to have been just the tail end of a long, tumultuous relationship among them all, and I was merely a passer-by in the night. Whatever their boiled-over disagreements with one another, they were more important to the ritualists than me. I was only the trigger, and also suddenly forgotten for the moment. I could have just gotten to my feet and snuck away, but I was worried that I still might not make it out. An overwhelming presence in the building remained, and if it didn't catch me, then Colchester or the Ratman would. The two of them were strong and fierce, and in my brief glimpse of their struggle, I saw that they were already close to overpowering the lesser five. My solution to everything was remarkably simple. If this had happened when I was an adult, I might have overthought it, or doubted my ability to do it. But easy, impulsive solutions are what being a kid is all about. So I did the only thing that made sense to me throughout that night. I got up, went over to the totem, and crushed it with my foot. I furiously stomped on it repeatedly, breaking the bones that comprised it with satisfying snaps. Upon hearing those sounds, and then seeing what I was doing, Colchester expressed his extreme disapproval by flying into another rage. He broke free from the others and came charging at me but his anger was short-lived and quickly turned into some sort of physical or mental anguish. Once the totem was completely shattered, the floating red orb in its centre turned black, melted into a liquid that oozed onto the tile, and then seemingly soaked into the tile. The substance had disappeared within seconds, and I think this caused a reaction in Colchester. He spasmed and started choking on liquid. Black fluid dripped from the pig mask eyes, and then he vomited up a torrent of that disgusting black gunt from the fountain. The others backed away from him, and I'm guessing they didn't know what was happening either. But he was obviously in pain and suffering as his body tried to purge something, well, unnatural. This was always where my repeating nightmares ended. With the totem destroyed, it no longer had a hold on my memories, and the rest of the night becomes a blur again though I now remember the rest just as well as any other fuzzy childhood account. Colchester ran off, clutching his chest or stomach. There's a chance that everyone else just stood around a moment longer, looking at each other and me as if wondering, well, what now? Didn't last for long. Since the moor was dark, the flashing red and blue lights that had suddenly appeared from the other side of the nearest locked doors filled the halls and scared them off. After they also disappeared from my life, I ran to the door, feeling overwhelmed by panic and desperation to get out of that building. I'm not sure, but when I destroyed the totem, all of Sleepy Pines may have trembled. If it wasn't from me severing some otherworldly grip on the place, then perhaps it was that unseen but omnipresent entity I'd felt since the start of that night. Either way, I'd return to the world of reason and everyday normal adults doing their job. The police officers that had come to my rescue weren't able to get in touch with any mall staff for reasons obvious only to me. After I ran up to the doors, they ended up breaking glass to get me out of there. My parents were waiting nearby in the van, and we had a tearful reunion, and I got the back of the vehicle to myself on the way home. I only have bits and pieces of these last moments of the night, so it's likely I passed out as the adrenaline dissipated and they brought me straight to bed. I never told my family everything. Well, they knew that I'd been trapped in a mall, alone at night for hours, and that was more than enough to warrant some child therapy. And after a few months or so, I must have shown good improvement, because they no longer saw a reason to keep at it, so long as I didn't visit the mall again. I don't remember much from my sessions, but I don't think I ever told my therapist the full truth, either. Who believe it? What would it add? If anything, I'd just be seen as delusional, or confusing the resulting nightmares with reality. People in animal masks, worshipping bones and pig blood. While therapy taught me how to manage my emotions and not let past events control me, I mostly credit my recovery to my mind quickly burying the reality of what transpired. I can't explain how it did so exactly, but it could have something to do with the unbelievable things I saw. Part of me just couldn't accept them as real. Or maybe the totem can remove or rewrite memories to disguise its nature 
make finding out what it is difficult. In my recurring flashbacks and dreams over the decades that take place at the ritual site, the totem itself never actually appeared until recently. I had forgotten its form. My theory is that the enigmatic object is a lock and a key. It can hide itself away from perception. But when I read Mike and Jenna's story and saw the videos, the totem unlocked itself within my psyche and freed other memories about the day as well. How it can do this is one more mystery as to its origin. I think any physical form it takes is tenuous, only as strong as the person that creates it. But it knows how to linger and wait to be made again can't even begin to assume anything about its powers or true purpose. I haven't seen any of the people at the ritual since then, and I never returned to that more. We did visit my uncle's family a couple more times, but I stayed at the house when the others paid a visit to Sleepy Pines. It had to have been understandable for my parents that I shouldn't need to relive something so traumatic. A few years later, once both of my cousins were adults with their own lives, my aunt and uncle moved from their small town. We had no reason to go back. Before I wrote this, I finally asked my mum about her perspective of that night, emphasising that I remembered everything she thinks happened to me again. Reawakened old guilt, but I assured her that I'd moved on and forgiven everyone for leaving me behind. Her answers gave me a clear understanding of how things went wrong. I can't really blame my parents anymore, at least not fully. It was an accident something that could happen to any large group at the end of a busy and chaotic day. It wasn't as basic as driving a van full of kids home and not noticing that I was missing. There was actually some miscommunication between my parents and my aunt and uncle about who was riding with who. Presence filled up both vehicles and meant that passengers had to be split up. In the confusion, each driver must have thought that I was with the other car. Specifics about which siblings and cousins were in which vehicle are lost to time. Not that it really matters. However things panned out, no one noticed I was missing until a few hours later, when it was time for bed. My parents rushed back to the mall after calling the police, and their response time was such that both parties arrived at just about the same moment, despite the difference in distance. Life moved on for us after that and the incident became just another one of those childhood disasters that big families get used to. All of my siblings have horror stories of their own as well, none as strange as mine. Not that I've divulged to any of them the full truth. I don't believe that the ritual site was ever discovered, or it was cleaned up in a hurry. No local newspapers had a story on any of that, well, not that I've found after an extensive search. However, I did manage to track down the words that the ritualists were chanting after repeating them in my head enough times and thinking about Colchester's reverence for local tribes. They're from the Seneca language, used by the Iroquois people in the area. Yogadahede, meaning the earth, and Awadinyanie, to breathe. Now, I'm not certain of the pronunciation, and they probably weren't either. They probably didn't have to be. It's the belief that counts. That fed the totem. But if there truly is something special about the land up there, the breathing earth, I wouldn't be surprised. It would track with what I felt and witnessed that one night in November. The one last thing I don't understand, to top off so many other things, is that I had to have been in that washing machine for at least several hours, since my mum swears that I didn't go to bed until midnight. There's no way that I would have willingly stayed in there that long, so I must be missing time. I either fell asleep without knowing, totally spaced out for a while, or something else happened the moment the mall closed up that defies explanation. If the totem can screw around with space, it's not a stretch to say that it could also play with time. The danger is great, but I have a feeling that it will be eventually remade again by someone with a different point of view than a few guilt-ridden capitalists in charge of a dying mall. Maybe then we'll get some answers, because well, I have none. Only guesses, and an outsider's story. Until then, I've recently found that sketching my own version of the totem on occasion is strangely soothing. It makes me feel calm. I kind of like it. I think it would look best if created with something artistic like clay. But I'm also aware of what it might do if fully realised. So don't worry about me. 
I'm fine. Everything in moderation. The Dead Mall by Tyler from the Cold Relic series. It was called Sleepy Pines Mall. A few miles off an interstate in America's northeast, at the centre of several small towns. It was a single story and only had two anchor stores, but it was sprawling considering its almost rural location. Built in 1973, it was one of the older shopping malls and opened before there were long-term strategies on mall viability. Popular for a time, its occupancy dwindled in the late 90s, and it lost its movie theatre and its Sears by 2003, before becoming a neglected, poorly maintained, and sometimes dangerous commercial plaza that was outdone by nearby rivals, and doomed by surrounding negative growth trends of the towns that kept it fed. The food court closed in 2006, and the last stores followed a year later. Sleepy Pines had its fans and grown adults who'd gone there as children, paying it nostalgic visits, well, as all malls do, but by 2010 it had become a mostly forgotten derelict with a parking lot full of weeds. Ten years later, and a lengthy demolition was in its final stages. I'd been assigned to be the foreman of the construction of the building that would replace it, a large warehouse and distribution center for a major retailer. I'd pay frequent visits to the site as the walls were torn down and the roof was gutted, myself having gone to the mall several times in my youth whenever my family was passing through the area, so I knew its layout well. By the winter of 2020, all that really remained of the structure was the back wall of its atrium, which once overlooked the fountain. A painted mural on tiles covered that wall. Well, efforts to save this artwork delayed its destruction several times, but enough funds were never procured to bring the wishes of perhaps only a few dozen people to fruition. Well, I'm no critic, but I always found it rather creepy anyway. The European settlers amid a backdrop of pine trees, where the natives they drove out now instead depicted as their friends. Well, their faces were plain and simple, their eyes staring off into a space where there was once a skylight. On the other hand, the trees looked like they were made by a different painter, and one more talented. The pines were muted in their colours, but highly detailed, with layers of darkness in their shadows where you might expect mischievous forest creatures to reside. The swirling, intricate patterns of the nearly black paint took the forms of deranged beasts, if looked at closely enough. But I think it was just the artist having fun, and not acting out with ill intent. It wasn't like the vast majority of the shoppers would stand around and study the mural closely, or not when there were sails to be found and warm pretzels to be had. Now the mural itself would be coming down soon, and ground on the next building would be broken after the spring thaw. What little demolition remained was also put on hold while the earth was still frozen. I went to the site a few days after New Year's to get my last look at the public painting, exposed to the elements and surrounded by a landscape of snow. I checked in on the operations trailer while there, just to give my best wishes for 2021 to the guy in charge, who I'd gotten to know over the years from various other projects. Hey, uh, you still like strange shit, right? He asked me after a few minutes of us chatting about our holiday get-togethers. Oh, I got something you'll love. My guys found it just before they left for the winter. I'm no good with electronics, you know, so, well, you might as well see what you can do with it. He handed me a GoPro camera, an earlier model that I would later learn was from 2013. Now the little box was in bad condition, and I didn't take into consideration how bad at first. And it was true, I did collect oddities and yard sale objects with inexplicable backstories in my spare time. It wasn't the camera itself that might rival some of my greatest finds. No, it was the potential of the footage on board it, if it had survived. Well, if it could explain how the poor thing had been beaten into such bad shape, then the story of the object would be made all the better. Look, oh, I had a long winter ahead of me with little else to do, so I figured I could spend a few nights cracking it open and seeing what was on its memory card. Jeez, I replied as I studied it in my hand. It's like it's, well, 
melted. Yeah, we dug it up and couldn't tell what it was at first. I have no idea if there was some kind of fire here, but it doesn't even look like burn damage. Well, he made a good point. There was no sign of smoke, no bubbles in the material, no metal fatigue. It was like something had turned it into clay and had its way with misshaping it into a twisted piece of art. The glass of his LCD screen and lens was intact, but the body was warped, stretched, and compressed, as if by tiny fingers. If the memory card was still in one piece, I'd never be able to pry it out. I'd have to carefully crack open the camera around it. Of course, I did have a big collection of tools at home, so I knew I could do it. There was every chance that the card was missing, or all corrupted, or all the data had been deleted. But now I was interested. I wanted to find out for certain. I told my friend that we should have lunch sometime, and then headed home. I was making good money, but I got to keep the house after the divorce, and had yet to get around to moving out and finding a better place. It was a small place, and half of it was spread across cardboard boxes, or otherwise just a neglected mess. My home office was the only decent room remaining, and it also featured my tool bench and the arsenal I would use to disassemble the scarred and malfunctioned lump that used to be a high-tech recording device. Well, I managed to break it open and separate several of its pieces, and eventually the micro SD card fell out from its slot. It was perfectly readable and full of video files, which I transferred to my computer and organized by date. There were 23 in all, most recorded over the course of two days in December 2013. So with a cold, quiet winter outside my window, I turned up the heat, brewed some coffee, and went through the files, knowing nothing about the camera's owner or what they'd experienced when I began. I'll summarize the portions that are more mundane or uneventful and fully transcribe the rest. File number one. Recorded on a chilly morning, with the operator obviously testing camera settings outside their house. No address can be seen, and the surroundings are typical suburbia, making the location difficult to identify. There's snow on the ground. It starts with the operator saying, Nice, as they zoom out on their new camera's now empty box. They're inside their messy car, and they focus on the house for several seconds before the video ends. File number two. The file created date indicates that this one was recorded just a couple of hours later. A young woman, around 30, is watching a pot boil on a stove. She's a small brunette with a bubbly attitude and big blue eyes. I quickly discern that this is the operator's girlfriend. They're both happy and energetic, and like they have their whole lives ahead of them. I'm definitely not married, and they've probably only been together a few months. I learn both of their names as the young man teases her a bit with the camera, and she remarks that she hopes he didn't spend too much on the new toy. Now, I'm not going to share their real names, so let's just call them Mike and Jenna. Now, they clearly like each other, and the clip ends after he tells her, This is a lot better than the old one. The more videos are going to look great, Jenna stirs some stovetop sauce and smiles. File number three. Mike records some football in the yard at another house. Even though the clip was made only a week after the previous, there's no snow present. In fact, everyone is running around in t-shirts, making it obvious that this was filmed much further south, away from the cold weather. It's a Thanksgiving gathering, and Mike is filming his three younger cousins toss around the old pigskin outside, trying his hand at some sporty action shots. It keeps going for about ten minutes, and friendly banter is shared among the family members. The cousins seem to like Mike, even as he keeps denying their request to join in. At the end, Jenna walks out of the front door and tells everyone that the meal is ready. File number four. Mike and Jenna visit a local mall in the area on Black Friday. It's large with two floors and doing well. The place is packed, and Mike gets a few minutes of the mall Santa and the line of kids waiting to see them. Jenna looks at the camera and smiles again. 
Mike comments that he hasn't been to a mall this busy in years. Oh, it definitely makes me nostalgic for the pre-pandemic days. File number five. Mike is seen on video for the first time at the mall, ten minutes later. Jenna gets in some framing practice. Mike tries to humour her with his grandiose gestures, like he's introducing the place to an adoring and large audience. He says some things about them all, but the crowds drown him out. The camera isn't really known for its audio recording quality. Well, this lasts several minutes as Jenna gets used to the device and how to hold it steady. Towards the end, she recommends getting some sort of mount for it, which it was designed to be used with, and Mike agrees. File number six. Well, things begin to get interesting. It's now December 15th and Jenna is doing another camera test around sunset. Mike is seen crossing the frame several times as he moves about and she pans the camera. They're getting footage of the front of Sleepy Pines Mall, which has just recently closed. Snow covers the neglected parking lot. Mike tries the door and looks frustrated that it's locked. I hear the agitated version of his voice as he remarks that they should have come yesterday. God, now it's too late. Jenna assures him that there must still be some way in, that someone had forgotten to lock one of the many doors. I understand now that they're urban explorers of some kind, but they likely just kept things easy and focused on malls. Judging by Mike's response about that not being a good idea, I figure that they hadn't broken into a place before. I rechecked the closure date of Sleepy Pines, which was December 14th. Yeah, they just missed their chance to legally or easily get inside and film a dead mall. Mike sounds ready to give up, mentioning how well their previous trip went to another mall in the region, and that they are never going to get their subscriber count up at this rate. Well, Jenna isn't so despondent. She wants to make her guy happy, and she mentions that since it took an hour for them to get there, they should at least try to get in. Mike sighs, nods, and smiles. File number seven. Shot a half hour later, it's now dark. Jenna is holding the camera, getting a selfie of both of them. They're under a buzzing wall light somewhere on the side of the mall, near a cracked open service door. Well, they both look pleased, but it's clear that they're still amateurs at the newest hobby they want to do together. Hey guys, it's Mike and Jenna, she says with an awkward grin. Um, so, well, we're here at Sleepy Pines Mall, and we're going to go and explore it together. If you've watched our first five videos, you know that we're both interested in this sort of thing. We're just going to go in for a quick look tonight, then come back tomorrow during the day. Whew, I bet it's really creepy in there now. All right, let's do it, Mike adds and then sidesteps inside. He opens the door and beckons in the viewer, while Jenna snaps the camera into a shoulder mount. The service corridor is poorly lit, and the 2013 hardware doesn't have the sensor chip to shoot in darkness very well. Digital noise fills the frame as they navigate their way into the mall proper, stumbling over some equipment, boxes, and cleaning materials that had yet to be removed from the area. Commentary is nearly non-existent, till they find another door and emerge into a side hallway that brings them to the atrium. Most of the mall's lights are still going, although the mural is bathed in shadow, giving its already creepy staring faces an ominous presence in the nearly empty building. For several minutes, the couple of explorers walk around, getting footage of the vacated stores. They reach the other end of the mall and head back to where they'd begun, saying very little as they collect footage. The clip ends with a ten-second hold on the mural, during which Mike can be heard laughing at after Jenna remarks, Yeah, that is a little scary. File number eight. Well, the two definitely don't have a script. As they perform a longer second walkthrough, they chat idly about how they feel about the place and experiences from past visits to other malls, just to feel dead air. Jenna is at least a competent cinematographer, even if her boyfriend leaves much to be desired in the information and anecdote side of things. 
If they weren't planning to add some interesting voiceover narration in post, they would have two very dull videos on their hands. It's around the five minute mark in this clip, while Jenna shows off the closed dollar theatre, that Mike finally mentions some personal history. I learn that he used to live in the area as a kid, and has fond memories of visiting Sleepy Pines, back when it had busy weekends and few closed doors. Some of my earliest memories were of coming here with my dad when I was five, he tells Jenna. So it uh, must have been around 1991. Yeah, I met Santa right over there. He points to a wide-open liminal space under a skylight in the center of the mall. It's sad what happens to these places, how the memories fade over time, you know. Was that why you were so mad when you found out you missed his final day? Jenna asks, now keeping him in frame like they were having an interview. He shrugs. Oh, I paid a visit a year ago when it was already deep in the shitter. Yeah, it would just have been symbolic or something. Well, we're both here right now, though. He pauses and looks away. Yeah, you ready to go? We can get more footage tomorrow during the day. We just have to keep that door from locking. Yeah, this place is starting to get to me. Empty malls at night are unnatural. They turn around and head towards the hallway where they came in. On the way, Jenna suddenly stops and swings the camera around. She stares into a lightless corridor, so dark that the sensor can't pick up anything. A posted sign indicates that the mall security center is at the end of the hall. She lingers on it for an unusual amount of time. And Mike asks off screen what she's looking at. Don't you hear that? She asks, nervousness in her voice. I turn up the volume as much as I can, but nothing strange passes through my headphones. If she's hearing something, the camera didn't pick it up. She looks into that corridor, as if more petrified by fright than curious. In the end, it takes Mike dragging her away to break her focus, at which point she seems to snap out of it. The clip ends with Mike staring at her and asking, What's wrong? If she gives him an answer, she does so when the camera is off. Well, at this point, I get onto YouTube and search for their names, adding Maul into the search form on a second try, and this brings me to their page. They really were just getting their start. The channel only has six subscribers, five videos with only a dozen views each, and no uploads for over seven years. I skim through their videos, all visits to other malls, and find nothing out of the ordinary. Their most recent upload started showing the signs of professionalism, with some of that voiceover narration they badly needed. Might share some history of the empty mall in another state they'd visited, and he does so with some enthusiasm. He and Jenna smile throughout their trip and look like they're having a good time walking through a shopping plaza of memories. They were one of YouTube's earlier Dead Mall channels, and, well, they'd had some promise. But seeing their inactivity only but confirms my worries that something bad happened to them. And a few minutes of Googling later, I found out that they'd been reported missing in early January 2014 at least a full two weeks after they started working on their ill-fated video. Well, naturally, I get the urge to skip to the end to find out what may have happened to them, but I convince myself to keep going through the files in order and take this trip with them as their latest expedition's first viewer. On a second look at the last few minutes of this file, I notice two pink pixels in random spots on the video. I know it's a sign of sensor damage, and I trace it back to when Jenna focused the camera into the dark hallway. After 30 seconds, one dead pixel shows up. A little later, the next arrives. It's as if there's something at the end of that corridor that's emitting a damaging, invisible light or other energetic phenomena which steadily overloads the camera sensor. But I don't know what else could do such a thing other than a powerful laser or radiation. So eagerly, I move on to the next clip. File number nine. Well, the dead pixels are here to stay. 
They're present throughout the video. I see Sleepy Pines' exterior again, this time early in the morning. Mike stands at the side entrance, his breath filling the cold air. He gives Jenna a thumbs up and she comes over and points the camera at the both of them. Uh, I'm Mike. And I'm Jenna. And then I add in unison, and today we're exploring Sleepy Pines Mall. Oh, cute. They proceed inside and arrive at the atrium without cutting the shot, even when there's no reason to keep things all in one take. But Mike must have done some research while at whatever hotel the two stayed at the night prior, as he starts going over the basic details of the mall. Its opening date and designer, a brief history of the area, a few controversies about its construction and maintenance record, and the stores that have come and gone. They all get a mention, though not in a scripted way. Ah, Mike has all this stuff memorised, and jumps from one bullet point to the next. Still, I'll give some props to the guy for remembering so much and getting it all out on the first try. Yeah, did we get it that time? He asks when they return to the atrium, where the fountain still hosts some coins and is half full of stagnant water. He smiles after Jenna quietly responds and adds, Okay, keep that one. So, uh, not actually their first try. Well, I don't know how many attempts it took, since they must have kept deleting prior takes to keep memory space free. Before Jenna stops recording, Mike wanders around a little, looking into empty stores. Eventually, he suddenly notices that the red light remains on. Hey, uh, you still rolling? Mike, I think we should check out the security area. He sighs and looks a little annoyed. You still care about that? Well, come on, we've seen just about everything else. We should get everything on film before they tear this place down. Well, there'll be rooms that are, you know, forgotten forever, never archived. Yeah, well, we don't need to be perfectionists. Yeah, but you went on and on last night about visits here with your family and friends. Your memories of the holiday decorations and seeing dollar movies. Really, Jenna? You're saying all this on camera. At least shut it off. The shot lingers a few moments longer, before Mike looks fed up and starts approaching the camera. He's about to grab it when the clip ends. Well, I guess every relationship has arguments, but it's a strange thing to have a fight about. It almost sounds like Jenna felt something that was calling to her. File number 10. Mike now stands in front of the dark hallway, although now, with the sunlight coming in through the nearby skylight, it's no longer pitch black. Mike looks like he's under just a little bit of duress. But I understand, knowing myself that sometimes you just have to do what your significant other wants. All right, so let's take a quick look down this hallway, he says, lacking his typical enthusiasm. It'll be a place you probably saw only if you tried to shoplift or something. You know, filmed without permission, like only criminal scum would do. Mike! Jenner exclaims. He fakes a smile and says, Let's check it out. The camera has already acquired a third dead pixel before they even start moving into the hallway. More pop up as they get closer as the sensor becomes more and more permanently damaged. But with the camera on her shoulder and Mike leading the way, Jenna doesn't notice. Well, it quickly becomes too dark for it to pick anything up again, but Mike turns on his phone's flashlight, which at least helps it show anything that's within its cone of light. They enter the security office and freeze for several seconds. An old desk and monitoring station in frame. What is that? Mike asks. Do you hear that? Yeah, some sort of electrical buzzing, Jenna answers. Weird, right? What the hell, Jenna? Why are we even checking this place out? God, one of us is going to get electrocuted. Can we please just get out of... Okay, okay, I just thought there'd be more to see. She then turns around to leave. 
but then looks back at Mike again after realising he isn't moving. He's staring into a small room to the side. His light is on a sign that reads, Lost and Found. Now he's the one that seems to be under a spell and just has to know what's beyond the next door. Without saying anything, he opens it and goes inside, while Jenna silently follows. What follows is, well, difficult to describe. The video goes almost completely dark. For some reason, Jenna doesn't point the camera to whatever Mike is looking at until the end of this clip. His phone light is only seen at the very edge of the frame. They both examine what is evidently a strange object. What is that thing? Jenna asks. No idea. Never seen anything like it. Oh, God. It's almost like it's... It's moving. Mike, don't. It's warm. How did this get here? Stop touching that thing. It's dangerous. Well, there's no such thing as a cursed object, Jen. I think we should just get this thing out into the light and get a better look at it. Oh. Oh, shit. What did you do? Mike, what's it doing? I don't know. I didn't... I, I didn't... They turn and run out of the room, but the camera still can't pick up anything they might be hearing. The two are frantic, and the video, what little there is to see, becomes a shaky mess. By now, scattered pink pixels partially cover the video, completely obscuring entire small segments of the frame. The two can be heard screaming in the last few seconds of the clip, which ends abruptly. With the darkness, I have no idea what kind of terror the two might have experienced. I would have thought they were already dead if this had been the last file on the card, or at best someone else found the camera and recorded more video before they also mysteriously disappeared. Analyzing the clip frame by frame reveals two elements that just barely got burned into the digital film. As they turn to run, Mike's light sweeps over the strange object they come upon. It's some sort of totem made out of unknown dark material and maybe three feet high. It sits in the middle of the lost and found room, on the floor, and is the only thing in the place at all. It's covered in carvings that form angular patterns, though I use the term loosely because there's no real pattern to the lines at all. They swirl and break off from one another in random, unappealing ways. It's like one of those AI-generated images that almost looks like something familiar and identifiable, but is never quite anything that really exists. Even so, it didn't look entirely alien, or forged by some forgotten tribe. It could have been someone's art piece, found at a garage sale many decades ago, its history and origins now long obscured. But the strange totem wasn't the sight I found really frightening. Oh. I don't think Mike and Jenna saw them before his phone light suddenly cut off, leaving them in darkness. I can't confirm whether or not they're actually moving or just writhing in place, but on the walls of the security room is a spreading sea of long, solid black worms. Well, I don't know how else to describe the things, but it's obvious in the few frames I get of them that they're no trick of the light or other optical illusion. Worms, moulding over the wall, like they're devouring it. After re-watching the entire clip several times, I close the video and try to wrap my head around what I just saw. God, I almost dread finding out what happens next. So I delay myself from opening the next file by refilling my coffee. It's around midnight when I move on. To a recording made three hours after the last. File number 11. I open the file with no expectations, and it right away defies explanation. While the smattering of dead pixels linger, it's as if the past trauma the couple had just experienced isn't a thought in their minds. And at first it's like they've gone to another location, and put on some new clothes, or rather old clothes, because it looks like Mike pulled a wardrobe out of the late 80s and changed inside of a brightly lit dressing room, 
all in the span of a few hours. Mike stands smiling, though he has a nervous twitch. It's apparent in Jenna's camera work as well, because her shot now has a constant tremble. The device is also no longer mounted, judging by the shakiness of the video. <sighs> Hi, guys, Mike says after taking a deep breath. Well, you're never going to believe what happened to us. If we get out of this... We will, Jenna replies, though there's no confidence in her voice. Right, right. Um, well, it'll be better if we just show you. He gestures to a mirror in the dressing room, and Jenna walks up to it to show herself in the reflection. She now looks sharp in a bold red blazer and capri pants, and her hair is fancifully styled up in a way that would take hours to achieve. But it's the camera itself that's even stranger. Holding it with two nervous hands, she brings it close to the mirror and... Well, it's no longer a GoPro. It's not even a digital device anymore. It's somehow a classic Polaroid. One of those old instant cameras. Yeah, weird, right? Mike continues. It doesn't have a screen on the back anymore, but it has buttons and uh, all of the on-screen information is inside the viewfinder. I don't know why or how, but how clothes change too. It's like... God, I don't even know how to say it. Man, God, we're going to get millions of views, baby. We're going to be on talk shows and scientists will want to... Mike... Can we please just get out of here? It's, it's too confining. All right, yeah. Well, let's just keep showing them. The two leave the dressing room and step out into a fully lit, packed Dillard's department store, just like the one Sleepy Pines used to have. But I hadn't seen one so busy in many years. And as Mike and Jenna keep pretty quiet and give a tour of the place, I steadily realize why it seems so odd. Like their clothes, those on all of the shoppers and staff, and those waiting to be worn on the racks and shelves. Well, everything is dated. It's old fashioned from around 30 years ago. Mike at one point even grabs a polo shirt and, with a stupid smile on his face, brings its price tag right up to the camera, remarking about how it's so cheap. Do you get it yet? he asks the viewer. I mean... It should be obvious what happened to us, right? We didn't believe it ourselves at first, but... Oh, sorry, man, he tells an older shopper he bumped into, who only responds by turning around and giving Mike a curious look. Well, come on, let's see them all. We haven't left this store yet. Oh, we needed some time to get over the shock first. I wish we'd gotten some of that recorded. God, Jenna was crying. All hysterical. Mike... She replies disdainfully. You're taking all this way too lightly. How can you not be terrified of what's happening to us? He frowns and admits. Oh, pardon me is, baby. But we can't explore this place while only being scared and worried. We can at least get it all on record. In case something happens to us and the camera is all that's found. Don't say shit like that, Mike. God, none of this is normal. Hey, come on, look. I'm right here. I'm right with you. We'll get out of this. Jenna begins to cry, and the camera points down at the floor. Mike can be heard saying, Let's talk. Just before the clip ends. I go directly to the next one. File number 12. It's a few minutes later now. The camera is now pointed toward the main thoroughfare of Sleepy Pines, past the Dillard's entrance. The shot lasts for about 30 seconds, during which dozens of shoppers walk by, many of them wordlessly glancing at the camera for a moment. Mike then walks into frame and guides Jenna out into the mall, though her movements show that she's still reluctant. I pull myself and my chair closer to my monitor and watch intently. I hear something familiar and nostalgic come through my headphones. I turn on the noise cancelling so I can feel even more engrossed by what I'm experiencing. 
Mike doesn't even know what to say about the enormity of the situation as they approach their exit. Or I hadn't given my time to process the previous clip, or how the look of the store could have been pulled off through some elaborate set dressing. The obvious but incredible answer to all of this had yet to feel like a valid thought in my head. Mike isn't the only one startled when a large woman suddenly enters the frame. On one second, it felt like we'd been exploring uncharted territory together, and the next, there's a big lady in a pantsuit threatening to spray him with a bottle of amber-coloured perfume in a crystal bottle. I told you, we don't need a sample, lady, Mike snaps at her. Oh, jeez. Oh, but this is our new file scent. There's nothing else like it on the market. Just one whiff, and you two will fall in love all over again. She seems aggressive. She keeps trying to spray Jenna and Mike as they shove their way past her. For about a second, her unsettling, toothy smile fills up the frame as the camera itself nearly smacks into her. What the hell's her problem? Jenna asks once they're in the safety of the mall. Oh, they could all be like that. Mike sighs and looks up at the skylights. Just maybe not as bad, well, from what I remember. A crazy bitch. God, are you okay? She didn't spray you right. Michael, what is this place? Jenna asks and points the camera at the ceiling, revealing the blue sky beyond the horizontal panes. The camera then settles back on Mike, and for several seconds he grins in a way that's almost as unsettling as the perfume lady's smile. I can hear the tinny, echoing music better now as Jenna waits for her boyfriend to say something. It's genuine, traditional music. Those light, co-opted renditions of pop music that went out of style years ago that's barely heard anywhere anymore. Somehow fittingly, as Mike grins like an idiot, Toto's Africa fills the air. Are you really going to make me say it? Mike asks. There has to be some other explanation. This all can't be real. Babe, we're in the past. We found some sort of time-traveling device, I'm telling you. He turns around and soaks in the mall, adding, My guess, 1990, maybe 91. All those 1980s styles are on the way out. Everything is so colorful. I'm talking post-Cold War chic, Jan. Well, then why did our clothes change? Why did the camera change? Where did our phones go? We need to make sure there's a way out, or a way to go back before we try and start having fun. I don't want to be trapped here. But we're not here to have fun. We're here to make history. Maybe even be a part of history. But we're filming the past, babe. We'll document everything we see, and then we'll find that weird thing again and figure out how it can send us back to 2013. But we could stay a while, right? I mean, this decade is so much better than the one we came from. With all that social media shit and dumbass challenges. I wish you wouldn't say that. I mean, our friends and family are there, Michael. Our future together. We can't stay. Mike sighs. He doesn't want another argument. He wants to explore what he thinks is the past. Some small piece of his own childhood. The shot lasts another few seconds on his impatient face. Before the camera pans down. I get a good look at Jenna's shoes to see that they've turned into a pair of red high tops. File number 13. Well, this clip goes on for over 10 minutes and it's a proper mall tour. Jenna quietly films every store they pass without argument while Mike tries to provide some commentary. But he's often distracted, overwhelmed by amazement every time he looks into a shop or sees a person walk by in nostalgic clothing, or finds a treasured piece of media from the era. He forces Jenna to spend several minutes just in Sam Goody, so she can get every audio cassette, early CD, or videotape in at least a few frames of video. All the while, Mike is overly excited, and Jenna seems wary of the crowds. The shop has almost approached an uncanny valley, I mean, they look like regular people, but they act like emotional automatons, staring vapidly at the two like they're intruders in their home. 
If she notices them, as do I, but Mike hardly seems to consider whether or not something is off with everyone other than himself and his girlfriend. He's under the effects of a siren call brought about by his love for a romanticised past. They pass by a brightly lit hair salon with colourful geometric shapes on the walls and a checkerboard floor. The three women seated inside are all getting the exact same hairstyle. The small movie theatre's marquee lists is now playing Total Recall, Gremlins 2, Terminator 2, City Slickers, The Rocketeer, and ironically, Back to the Future Part 3. We see more mall store staples, many of which no longer exist anywhere. A KB Toys, a Walden Books, a merry-go-round filled with clothes for teenagers. I recognise most of the places, and sure, I miss seeing them if I think about it. But they all had their time, and I don't worship the past like Mike seems to. While it's certainly interesting to see all of these old stores in modern high definition, dead pixels aside, I do find myself just hoping the two make it out. Sleepy Pines looks very different overall. It has big blue, red and yellow painted lines running along its wall. Neon lights cast their glow on indoor trees and lounge areas full of boxy chairs and couches. Coin-operated rides sit out front of the arcade, for the kids too young to venture in and play the cabinets that brighten noisy pixelated games inhabit. Well, I can empathize with Mike. Being a kid during this snapshot in time, wanting to go back and feel something genuine again if he believes the present is shallow and hopeless. But that idealism isn't going to find either of these young adults a way out. All the while, the calm cheerfulness of the more music undercuts the rising dread I begin to feel about a situation I'm hopeless to change. Wow, Mike says wistfully as they reach the Sears at the other end of the mall. It's... it's great, Jan. What an experience. You got all that, right? Yes. Now can we go back to the lost and found? We need to get that thing to send us back home. I wonder if the younger me will show up if we wait around. Baby, I don't think you appreciate all of this enough. How often do you get to take your girlfriend to the freaking past and show them some place that meant so much to you? After waiting for a response from her that doesn't come, he sighs, nods, and says, All right, fine. Let's get a good shot of the mural on the way back. We head to the mall atrium, where Jenna lets the mural fill the frame. It's incomplete, and even creepier for it. Two-thirds of the forest segment is done, but the five figures standing in front of it have yet to be painted, and are just a solid, ghostly white. Well, I didn't know that the whole thing wasn't finished all at once. It suggests that it might be something to my idea that the poorly drawn pioneers and natives were added by a second artist. Maybe even just as an excuse to cover something up on the original background. Oh, that's weird as hell, Mike says as he looks at the artwork. We must have been brought back to one of the few days when the mural was still being made. Jenna grumbles and starts to pressure him to focus on getting themselves home, but is interrupted when more security comes over and reminds the pair that they can't just shoot pictures in the mall without permission unaware that their mutated camera is actually filming video. Sure, no problem, Mike is heard saying after the camera goes to Jenna's side and is pointed at the floor. Hey, um, can we check your last and found? We think we, um, left something behind when we last... And the clip ends, as abruptly as I've come to expect. File number 14. The next file was created four hours later. I'm seriously concerned about what might have happened in the time in between before I open it. Mike and Jenna are staring at the camera together. They're back in one of the Dillard's changing rooms, where they might feel safe. The light flickers above them, and now they both look noticeably stressed. Hey, guys. Mike tries to find the words and wraps an arm around Jenna's shoulder. Um, so, uh, here's the part where we have to tell you that things aren't looking good for us. I still don't know how or why we're in the past. We can't find the thing that brought us here. We've looked all over. Every store, every back room. Every staff room you could think of. 
Well, it feels weird trying to sneak around, you know. The people here are always looking at us. I don't think any of them have left either. They're all the same shoppers that were here when we arrived. Something's wrong with this place. I should have seen it earlier, but I was too busy being too stupid about everything. The doors are all locked, Jenna adds tearfully, as she seems to come to terms with their situation. We tried all of them, and they won't budge. We picked up one of the payphones, but there's not even a dial tone. God, we're going to tear this place apart if we have to. We'll find that thing, whatever it is. Just in case we don't make it out, and you find these videos, please, call my parents. Their home number is... Mike! Shh! Jenna suddenly shushes him. She points towards the edge of the frame. Mike turns the camera around to show the gap at the bottom of the changing room door. After several seconds, a pair of large feet stuffed into high heels steps into the space. They turn towards the door, and it rattles violently. Jenna can be heard suppressing a scream. The door keeps shaking for about a full minute, before the assault on it finally ends. Without saying a thing, the large woman on the other side walks on. As upset as she is, Jenna picks up the camera again, nearly dropping it as she films Mike cracking open the door and looking around. He gestures for her to come out, and they make an exit from the store by sneaking behind clothes racks and keeping quiet. The other shoppers look at them again, but don't bother them. Just before they can leave, Mike gets a shot of the perfume lady standing near the store entrance. I recognize the shoes and realize that she must be stalking the pair at this point. Without warning... She turns toward them, and they duck behind a display table full of polo shirts. I pause on a frame of her face, and see how hideous she has become. Her bulbous face is covered in bright red lipstick, sky blue eyeshadow, and bright pink blush. But it all does nothing to help with the fact that she has greasy, disheveled hair and yellow, crooked teeth. After a few seconds, the camera pops back up. The perfume lady is gone. Where is she? Jenna whispers. I don't know. We just have to get out of the store. We never should have come back in here. We knew the door would be locked, just like the others. Mike, we have to... Jenna is cut off by the sound of ruffling fabric. She and Mike both flip around to see the perfume lady staring right at them from the top of a clothes rack. She slumped over some of those chrome bars, her blob-like arms dangling down like she's in a beast sloth with a murderous glint in its eye. She curls her lips into a demented grin and holds up the perfume bottle, seemingly glued to one of her hands. Mike and Jenna quickly work up the nerve to get on their feet and make a run for the store entrance. Judging by the sounds coming from behind them, their pursuer knocks over the entire rack and crashes into more displays as she gives chase. There are expletives, terror, and panic in Jenna's voice as she and Mike dash out towards the mall. She briefly turns the camera back to capture the crazed lady on film. She's become animalistic, running on all fours with eyes as black as a shark's. Jenna lets out a shriek as the feral beast gains on them. But the perfume lady stops right at the boundary of the store, as if there's an invisible barrier she can't pass. After catching his breath, Mike flips her off, and the woman simply regains her composure, getting back on two legs and returning to the cosmetic department, that grin never leaving her face. What the hell, Mike? She's not human. I mean, no person acts like that. Jenna shouts at him. We need to get out of this place. Right goddamn now. I know, Jen. I know. At least she can't leave the store. Oh, shit. Mike tries to calm himself down as the shoppers stare at him. Most of them now just standing around as if they're NPCs who've run out of walk cycles. He points the camera up at the skylights, revealing that it's dusk. The neon lights from the mall now determine the colours, splashing everything in hues of reds, purples, pinks and blues. 
I can also hear that the music has slowed down and become distorted, like it's a talking electronic toy with low batteries. The audio seems to unnerve Mike, who closes his eyes to think, but can't get comfortable enough to do so. It's like this place is starting to fall apart. Well, he mutters out the same thought that just crossed my mind. Jen, we need to find something heavy. Like hammers, crowbars, maybe just a trash can. We'll smash our way out. He proceeds to shove his way past the crowd of zombie-like onlookers, yelling at them to get out of his way all the while. Jenna follows at a distance, getting a face full of their staring eyes on the way. They briefly stop near a display of a red 1990s Corvette, where a nearby small film crew seems to be trying to make a commercial. Hot lamps hit the swelling face of an older man in a grey suit. He repeats the line, A lot is happening at Sleepy Pines Mall. Why not come see what's new today? Several times, as Jenna also films a scene. Mike then loses his patience and enters the shot, but the attempt at making a commercial continues. You've been here for hours, Mike tells the crew angrily. Who are you people? How did you get in here? What ad agency do you work for? Michael, stop, Jenna quietly pleads. Don't antagonize them. They're not even real. They're mindless, just running on some kind of script. With no concern for consequences, Mike knocks over the lights and the expensive film camera and then steals the tripod. Jenna doesn't know what to make of it. She just stands in place in shock as Mike walks away with the bulky piece of equipment. And, actually, Mike seems to have a point, because the actor simply keeps repeating the same segment of the commercial several more times with the crew watching and going through the motions. The camera pans down to the floor, and the clip ends. File number 15. It starts with Mike midway through another swing of the tripod against a glass door. He's been at it for a while, based on his apparent exhaustion. He lands the heavy metallic tripod plate against the glass several times, but he's yet to crack it. The glass doesn't even seem to have any give to it. Might as well be hitting a brick wall. The vintage cars and trucks in the parking lot outside seem real, but I'm not sure. There are no people outside in the darkness, yet the couple are trapped in the mall with hundreds of them, so everything beyond the walls may not even have reason to exist. Whatever time travel trickery is going on, it likely can't extend past the building in which it was triggered. Jenna can be heard sobbing quietly. She pans to a trash can on the floor, knocked over, and she gives it a kick, giving me the impression that she'd used it to join in the effort before she gave up and started filming again. I also notice that the music is now completely gone, replaced by a monotone buzzing sound. Mike hits the door twelve times in all, working up a sweat and eventually hopelessly claps into the floor. The recording of his effort then ends. File number 16. The camera sits on a table in the food court. It's getting late, but it looks like all of the places are still open. The pair have cups of soda and slices of pizza on paper plates in front of them, but they both look hesitant to eat. It isn't that they're only losing hope of escape. They're also afraid of the food. And I can't blame them. They're also mostly in shadow, now lit only by the neon lights. We... Uh, Really going to eat this? Mike asks listlessly. I mean, who knows what it's made of? Well, Jenna murmurs back. We have to eat something. We're starving. Mike looks into the camera and says tiredly, Yeah, so the clocks here say it's two in the morning. Things just keep on going. It's a 24-7 mall now, I guess. We couldn't last much longer without eating or drinking something. Well, if this is what ends us, at least you'll know it wasn't the perfume lady. In one of the few acts of bravery I've seen Mike exhibit across the videos, he takes a sip from the cup before Jenna. Slowly at first, before gulping it down thirstily. 
She then does the same with her drink, and they soon look a little more confident about trying something solid next. Well, it tastes like Dr. Pepper, Mike says and examines his pizza. It looks authentic enough, even though I don't think much of anything is real in this place. Okay, before it gets cold. He takes a bite, chews, and eventually swallows. Deciding it tastes edible enough and is worth the risk, he quickly gobbles up the rest, while Jenna remains more reluctant and takes her time with her food. It's too dark in here, she says, looking around. All of the ceiling lights shut off hours ago, but the people didn't even seem to notice. Oh, we'll try to get some sleep in the arcade, Mike tells her. All the games are still running. I think that's the most light we'll get. What's going to happen to this place? Well, maybe eventually the dream ends and we wake up. Even the guy at the Sabaro didn't speak, or ask us for any money. Yeah. Mike then deadpans a joke. No wonder the chain's dying off. They sit, drink, and eat quietly for another minute before the video ends. Bar number 17. This one takes place entirely inside the mall's old arcade, which closed in 1998. The only sources of light are the flickering cabinet screens of games on their demonstration modes. But there are so many that the place remains the brightest locale of the mall at this point. Mike holds the camera this time, but I don't know what he's trying to archive, other than the miserable conditions the two have found themselves in. He makes a few rounds around the arcade cabinets, muttering incoherently to himself. Kids and teenagers fill the large room with a carpet featuring planets and stars, but none of them move. Some have their hands on joysticks or buttons, while others just stand and stare with arms at their sides. Mike tries to elicit a response from one of the kids, getting the lens right up into their face. Their eyes are glazed over, looking straight ahead as the light of a fighting game reflects off their large pupils. They're just as catatonic as everyone else. Mike throws a swear at him before going over to the prize counter and getting a shot of all the toys he'll never be able to claim. I went to a good university, he tells his audience of one, and turns the camera on himself so he can speak angrily directly into it. I had a good job lined up. And I like the 1980s. The 90s, so what? Doesn't mean I want to be stuck in some shitty, bizarro version of nostalgia. Oh, I never want to visit a mall again. And the camera battery. It should have died a long time ago. But the icon says it's still full. God, nothing is right. It's all wrong. We're never getting out of here. Still filming, he goes over to one of those large cabinets that you can sit down inside of for some privacy and immersion. It's an old racing game with a steering wheel, and Jenna is curled up on the seat, facing the wall, sleeping or trying to. As this fire was created five hours after the previous, I get the feeling that Mike couldn't sleep, or just gave up trying. He decides to let Jenna be, and slumps down onto the carpet. Several cabinet screens are in frame, the kids in front of them now lifeless silhouettes. Mike can be heard getting emotional for a few minutes over the noises of the games. Suddenly he hears a loud metal clang outside, echoing down the mall's corridor. He jolts up and points the camera at the darkness outside that only the neon lights can penetrate. His breathing is shallow and rapid. Nothing shows up, but at least nothing he can see but he still ends up running into a small utility closet without alerting his girlfriend to a possible danger and closes the door. Following another few seconds of a pure black image filled with digital noise and dead pixels, the video ends. I assume he eventually fell asleep in that cramped space and that the experience was beginning to wear on his sanity by this point. File number 18 the camera is aimed up at one of the skylights, where early morning light is coming through. It's possibly about 8am or so, 
meaning Mike and Jenna are nearing 24 hours spent in the mall. Mike pans down to show the mural and the fountain in front of it, where Jenna scoops up a handful of water and washes her face. Around her are the mindless shoppers, all of them still idle, despite the fact that the place seemed to have never opened or closed. This version of Sleepy Pines, whether it really existed in the past or not, just is come to realize that it represents the memory of a mall, and people are there to remember it. Times where it is empty and dormant don't factor into this corrupt amalgam of its golden days of service. The speakers are still pushing out some sort of noise, but now all I can hear are atonal crackles. Mike approaches Jenna, leaning forward and staring at her reflection in the fountain. She looks at him as he draws near now looking incapable of ever smiling again. I still worry about Mike's mental state, but she doesn't seem afraid of him. She's just tired, or starting to resign herself to their imprisonment. Jen, are you hungry? Mike asks flatly. The Cinnabon still seems to be running. I could get you something. She shakes her head and replies. Mike... We need to find a way out today. Whatever it takes. We can't give up. We just can't... I know. We'll try something else. I was thinking maybe the air vents. Jenna looks like she's about to say something, but instead goes back to looking into the fountain. After several seconds, she takes on an inquisitive expression and leans forward. She stays in frame, but I get the impression that Mike actually was looking elsewhere while the camera remains pointing at her. Jenna takes out one of the coins from the fountain and studies it. I can barely hear her murmur. Michael, look at this. But Mike doesn't hear her and shouts, Jen, run. The camera swings around and I see the perfume lady aggressively approaching at a fast and unstoppable walking pace. The Dillard's far behind her. It's the first time we've seen her leave the invisible boundary of the department store, and Mike and Jenna seem shocked about this as well. The large woman still has a perfume bottle in one hand, but there's no telling what she really wants. Not ready to find out, the couple start running. File number 19 An hour after the previous video ended, Jenna gets the camera going again to show Mike crouching down between some washing machines and peeking around the corner of one of the big white cubes. They're somewhere inside the Sears store. Oh, I think we finally lost her, Mike sighs and slumps against the machine. Crazy bitch. Why is she the only one still moving around? He shakes his head and looks up to see that the camera is recording. Mike? Jenna says quietly. There might be a way out, or, or something. He grumbles back. Oh, what are you talking about? Well, don't get your hopes up, but... I found it. Well, here, just look. She hands him a quarter, and he checks both sides of it. He looks at Jenna like she's crazy at first, but then realizes why she sees it as important. It's got the state art on the tail side. Well, that didn't start until around 2000. Yeah, um, it was from 2005. I don't think the coins in the fountain were affected by any of this. Something to do with the water, maybe? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, none of this does. But maybe there's something we can do with the water. Yeah, whatever took us to this bizarre version of the past, maybe water's the answer, the way out. Mike frowns. So, what? Should we jump into the fountain, hold our breaths, and hope for the best? Or do you want to open up all the faucets in the mall and flood it? But how does this big revelation help us? We have to keep trying, Michael. We need to talk. We need to understand what happened to us, what this place really is, and why we're here. I don't think we're really in the past. Didn't you notice how early it got dark yesterday? There aren't any holiday decorations here, and all the fake people are dressed like it's summer. 
But the day didn't last any longer than it did before. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess. I think that device somehow recreated local history by altering all the nearby material. But it isn't perfect. It can't sustain it for long. It's not stable. It's all breaking down. We're running out of time. Oh, that's insane. You have any better theories? Do you think we actually went to the past? Mike takes on a rather vapid expression as he thinks for a few moments before replying. Well then, what's the deal with the perfume lady? I don't know. Maybe she's guarding the place. Maybe she's the thing keeping us here. She's hunting us. She's a threat, so I say let's just try to kill her. How? he asks, and rather stupidly in my opinion. Well, we could start by trying. Why don't we bash her over the head and see what happens? She's not real, Mike. None of these people are real. All right. Yeah, fine. We'll smash her head in and see what comes out. He tries to act tough for his girlfriend, but he can't back it up. After he agrees to commit some form of homicide, the two hear a noise, and he panics just as much as she does when they see the silhouette of the perfume lady against the light of the Sears exit to the parking lot. I'm not sure whether she was just standing there looking menacing, or had started chasing them again. The clip ends just as the couple start running. File number 20 with only four files left to view, I know that Mike and Jenna's journey is coming to an end. This one opens with Mike holding the camera at himself, and behind him are boxes of shoes. He's at a Payless or a footlocker. He has his free arm wrapped around the camera tripod from earlier, which rests against his shoulder. He must consider it the best weapon he could find. Oh, we think it's been over 24 hours since this all started, he tells me. We're prepared to take on that perfume bitch now, mentally and physically. Oh, we don't know where she is at this moment, but well, you got to see this. He gets up and goes to the store entrance, where Jenna is standing guard and looking into the hall. She's holding a metal bar in one hand, I think taken from a clothes rack, and a fire extinguisher in the other. Look at them, she murmurs. They're getting worse. Mike gets a little closer to one of the nearby kids, but still keeps a safe distance. Thick, black ooze, moving as slowly as hot tar, is dripping out of the boy's mouth. Smaller streams of the stuff come out of his lifeless eyes. Mike pulls back and pans the camera to reveal that the surrounding adults are suffering from the same affliction. Still, they all do nothing but stand quietly. Jenna walks into the frame and says, That's what I'm talking about, Mike. This place is falling apart. First it'll be the more complex things, like the people. Then the rest of it'll follow. The whole building. Yeah, but not us, right? Jenna doesn't have an answer, but there is doubt in her eyes. They move away from the store, Jenna ready to strike with her crowbar. Everyone they pass is disintegrating from the inside out, but none of them act aggressively or move in the slightest. Mike points the camera up to the skylights, where a miasma of black specks is rising and beginning to smother the sunlight. As he pans back down, he catches on film one of the shoppers losing their arm. It simply breaks off and falls onto the floor, where it slowly melts into a pool of black liquid. At this point, they're out of expletives and just accept it. Even the movie theater's marquee has been corrupted, or is glitching like a crashing computer program. The only two legible titles are Casablanca and Gone Girl, neither of which came out anywhere near the supposed emulated time period in which the two are trapped. The other spots on the marquee are jumbles of letters and numbers, and a pile of them is building up on the floor by the box office. Mike turns away and focuses on the fountain they're closing in on. The mural behind it has lost all its elements and is now a solid black. Jenna runs over to the water and looks down into it. She dips her hand in 
and then steps in fully, submerging herself to just below her knees. Are you really expecting something to happen? Mike asks as he catches up. You're just getting soaked. It might be hard running in wet, squishy shoes, Jan. Maybe we won't have to run anymore if this is our way out. He looks down at her feet and mutters. Come on, do something. What are you hoping will happen? I don't know. Maybe for my shoes to change back? Mike gazes into the fountain, bringing the camera close to its surface. He notices the coins and takes one out to look at the year it was minted. You were right, he admits. You've been putting more thought into all of this than I have. I guess anything's worth a shot at this point. He points the camera straight up for about a full minute, leaving a bit of his hair in the frame as the clouds of dark particles thicken above. He has some time to think his deep thoughts, and he swings it back down and gets a shot of Jenna's shoes again. They're still red high tops, and she expresses her disappointment with apparent anguish. Well, I don't know how long she stayed in the fountain, since the video ends a moment later, with Mike trying to be considerate and offering assuring words. File number 21 Over two hours later, Mike gives me a shot of the skylight again, only now the dark particles are burning away into a thick mist that almost completely obscures the sunlight. It moves like boiling water, forming a wriggling cloud across all the top half of Sleepy Pines. The writhing mass reminds me of the worms crawling on the wall from earlier. But it gets worse. The camera sweeps down to the walls of the atrium, where large tiles are breaking loose as more black ooze pours out and spreads across the floor. Jenna walks toward the camera, trying hard not to step in the gunk. She stares at Mike for several seconds and then keeps walking past him. The place has gone to hell, he mutters into the microphone. He then asks Jenna, We're doing another walk. Nothing's changing with the doors. The people in the stores are almost gone, but the doors are still solid, Jen. If everything is burning off and melting, then there has to be a way out. It has to emerge. Yeah, maybe... We've been going back and forth for a few hours now. I'm going to go to the food court to see if there's anything left. I'm not sure that's a good idea. He follows her anyway, and they cross through a hallway that looks more like a moving, dripping cave system of black magma than anything human hands had made. I think it's all being reclaimed by the device that projected a version of the mall that emulates its past, but one that never really existed. They make it to the food court, now nearly pitch black as its primary light source, sunlight, has all but been completely blotted out. The food is darker still. The sub sandwiches, Chinese noodles and rice, and Sabaro's pastas and pizzas have lost their colour and form as they turn into slag. There's nothing left, Jenna sighs. God damn it, I'm so hungry. I just hope that, you know... What we ate before passed through us enough, and we don't have any of this nasty stuff inside us. The two look down at one of the shopper's heads on the floor, separated from its body and still staring ahead mindlessly in a pool of its own gunk. They don't remark on it. It must really be a common sight by now. Mike, Jenna says while the camera is still pointed at the floor. What is it? That kid. You've got to be shitting me. What about him? Mike walks off, only bringing the camera back up when he's a few feet away from a young boy, five or six years old. His gooey insides are still intact for now, and he looks blankly into space like all the others. Well, I put the pieces together on why Mike suddenly sounds so upset, just before he confirms it. Jan, that's me. Why am I here? Why comes over to get a good look at young Michael, and then tries to comfort the adult one as he keeps the camera on the kid's eyes. It doesn't mean anything, she tells him. Well, how can you say that? Whatever created this place just... Well, it just pulled from a pool of faces. 
may be full of everyone who ever came here. But that could be over a million people. Why did I just now find the young me? Where was he? How does, whatever this is, know who I am? This is all so screwed up. God, it's messing with us. You know we're never going to get an answer. Let's just go back to looking for a door. Or maybe focus on staying safe until another path opens for us. Mike takes a deep breath and turns the camera back around to show the two of them again, both clearly exhausted. He works up the confidence to say, The next time we turn this thing on, we'll be filming our escape. Or already back in our hotel room. God, I'm sick of this place. I think we'll be taking our channel in a different direction after this. They both lock eyes and share a brief kiss before this video ends. File number 22. Unfortunately, Mike lied. Created another two hours later, this one starts with another shot of the skylights and part of the wall right beneath them. Now, finally, it seems things are reverting. The thick fog of particles has disappeared and there's a few feet worth of the more recent aged atrium wall between the ceiling windows and the black goo, which is no longer actively moving. Instead, the material is now like a dried flaking crust. A few chunks break off of the mass and turn to dust on the way down. It's as if the 2013 version of the mall is emerging from a cocoon. Hey, uh, it's us again, uh, hopefully for the last time, Mike says and gets both of them back in frame. Their eyes are half closed and they look ready to sleep for a week. Well, we still couldn't find a way out, but it's starting to look like we just have to keep waiting a little longer. Sleepy Pines is returning to normal. Very slowly, Jenna adds. Yeah. yeah, look at this. In a sweeping 360 degree shot, he shows off the atrium and the three main hallways. It's all coated black, including the floor, turning the place into a demented Dali painting. It absorbs all of the color and most of the light, but there's enough sheen to the crusty darkness to make out its melted wax shapes and texture. The pair stand to avoid sitting on the stuff, since all of the chairs and couches are also gunkified. Even the fountain has been affected, and it's now just a solid black basin that still holds its water. All the people are gone, melted into the floor, Mike sighs. The, uh, fragrance fiend has been MIA for a while now, so I think we scared her off or something. And it's all coming to an end. I begin to feel some relief myself, after having an elevated heartbeat for nearly an hour from the safety of my office chair. I start hoping again that they made it out, but just drop the camera on the way, maybe. I look at the little thing on my desk, my mind still trying to process the idea that it had been twisted into a very different size, shape and model before being twisted right back again. Mike goes on to say, we still don't know what happened to our phones, so hopefully we'll be able to flag down a car and get some food, get back to our hotel room, close the curtain, and sleep. Sound good, Jen? Jen? He looks over to see her staring down at her shoes, which she quickly gets into frame. They've changed back into a modern pair of sneakers. Mike, it worked, Jenna murmurs. Yeah, yes. This took a long time. Hey, did you feel anything? My feet tingle for a second, and then I look down and... She stops suddenly as a loud, thundering crack echoes through the atrium. What the hell was that? Mike exclaims and swings the camera all the way around to show a large segment of the melted black wall near the KB toy store breaking apart. Oh, Jen, I think it's speeding up. We might be able to get out in just a few minutes. Oh, thank God, she breathes out. The wall cracks again, and then a torrent of ooze, which never dried, comes pouring out. Mike takes a step back, and the three of us watch in dread as an inky arm emerges from the opening, its claw-covered hand grasping the side to tear open the rest of the chrysalis. Like 
the grotesque insect emerging from inside. Four more arms spring out and quickly rip apart the shell. A deformed, hulking dark mass over seven feet tall lurches forward, its four legs and nine arms wriggling about as if they're trying to free themselves from the true owner of the body. The disgusting and horrifying chimera has five mouths, well, at least that I can see, but only a single eyeball manages to protrude from the dripping, fleshy shadow. Multiple voices, all of them dissonant and guttural, manage to gurgle out. Try our new fall scent. Jesus Christ, Mike yells out and grabs for the tripod, resting against one of the lounge chairs. Before he can grasp it, the monstrous creature emits a loud buzzing sound. The camera picks it up this time. For Mike and Jenna, it's so painful and deafening that they have to cover their ears. And in doing so, Mike ends up flinging the camera away. It lands at an angle in the melted floor, where the dried ooze covers a part of its lens. The moment the shrieking begins is also when more dead pixels start to appear, much faster than when it happened previously. Every two or three seconds that pass, another one pops up. I'm still able to see enough of the scene that follows to discern what happens next. Though in pain, the couple manage to get their weapons, and as the creature stumbles into the frame, Mike hits his body and multiple arms with his tripod several times with as much force as he can muster. Jenna jams her metal bar into his body, but it gets lodged into the mass and starts sinking into it. When she realizes she can't pull it out, she begins spraying the creature with foam from the fire extinguisher. It seems to slow it down, but that isn't enough for either of them. Uh, they know they need to destroy it, or at least try to. Its body covered in foam, and maybe blinded by it, Jenna shoves the entire red canister into one of its mouths. Mike bashes the extinguisher in deeper with the tripod, and the handle audibly gets squeezed within its maw. More foam is dispensed directly down its gullet, paralyzing this abomination. Jenna grabs Mike's hand and gestures toward the fountain, I guess seeing it as their best option, though I lack the information to know exactly what they expected to do for them. Even so, they run off into the background of the shot and visibly jump into the water. They don't emerge before the video ends. In the last ten seconds, after the foam stops pouring out of the creature's mouths, it collapses to the ground, where it starts crawling towards the fountain, screeching and sprouting more arms as it does so. With over half of the video's pixels either dead or showing nothing but the blackness the lens is sinking into, the clip finally ends on its own, likely because the camera is too badly damaged to continue recording. File number 23 well, I want a conclusion, but I should have expected that I wouldn't get one. My PC never generated a thumbnail for this final file, so I knew in advance that there'd be something wrong with it. The warning about it being damaged doesn't deter me from trying alternate ways to see inside it. I mean, the file size is over 25 megabytes, so there has to be something within its bits. Eventually, after trying several restoration and video editing programs, I managed to extract some information. It's nine seconds long, though that means little when everything about the file is corrupted to begin with. The audio is nothing but a loud buzz similar to that the creature let out. Nearly every frame of video is just a mess of the jumbled greens and blacks of more unreadable data. Even so, I want to say that I did everything possible. So I go through the video frame by frame, all 60 of them for each second. Only two frames, one five seconds in and the other just near the end, survived and are decipherable, despite still having a flood of pink dead pixels. The first is a single frame of Sleepy Pines during the day, looking normal with a few shoppers walking about. Many of the stores are closed or empty. But the arcade is still open, placing this image sometime before 1998, but after the events across the rest of the files. The other one takes me back to where it all began, showing the totem in the lost and found room, blurred by camera motion. 
is a duplicate frame from file 10. The remaining several hundred frames remain corrupt, and the data created for number 23 defaults to the Unix time of January 1st, 1970. Well, I don't think that last file was created by pressing the record button. My guess is that it was generated via hardware error, possibly while the camera was reverting back to its natural form. But that doesn't explain where it could have pulled that picture of the mall in decline taken years later. I stay up another hour into the night, researching anything I can think of about the mall, or Mike and Jenna. I find the commercial we saw being shot by the Corvette on YouTube. I almost believe I might see the couple walking about in the background but I go through the retro 30-second spot for the mall several times, but none of the featured smiling shoppers look anything like them. Even so, seeing all the era-appropriate clothes and the appearance of the mall make me appreciate just how accurately the strange, unknown, and missing device managed to recreate the place from the past. And then, at four in the morning, as I'm starting to crash, Something casts doubt on the genuineness of everything I just saw. Although Mike never posted about it on what little social media presence he had, I find out through another student's Facebook posts from Mike's university days that he attended several special effects classes in his junior and senior years. I go to bed thinking about what this might mean and how it really could have all just been an elaborate underground art project. Maybe Mike had melted several cameras and placed them about in abandoned moors to attract attention to himself, or become the star of some new urban legend. Or he and Jenna could very well be missing on their own accord, just to make it all appear authentic. Even with those doubts, I go through the files several more times across the following days, looking for any giveaways that everything was faked, albeit very well but I'm not very good at spotting the tricks he could have used, or seeing the imperfections in any elements you'd need a computer to render. I have lunch with the buddy who gave me the camera a week later, and tell him all about it. We end up having a laugh, and he gets me out of a rut that resulted from my viewing experience by telling me that he was almost certain it was all fate, because it just sounds too Hollywood horror to be true. In a few years, Mike, and maybe Jenna as well, would surely emerge as modern artistic visionaries, and everyone that had found a copy of their videos would have something worth a small fortune on their hands. But despite saying all of that, as we head out of the restaurant, he does mention two final little details. The camera, it turns out, was somehow found embedded inside one of the mall floor tiles. Oh, one more thing. Early in the demolition, the crew found a metal bucket in one of the food court kitchens with several unexplainable bite marks around its edges. Like well, someone with a strong pair of chompers snacked on it. He gets quiet for a moment after revealing these findings, but then grins and adds, well, maybe those kids were just that good. Maybe. But I can't bury the part of me that believes everything I saw and knows deep down that what happened to Mike and Jenna is, in fact, a mystery. While I'm still in the area, I drive to what remains of Sleepy Pines one last time, and on this visit I get a really good look at the mural, coming up close to it, while my mind fixates on what might have transpired on the now barren grounds. I try to remember what it was like when I was younger, back when I first visited them all and had studied the intricate swirls, finding secret critters among the dark forest. But first I think they're all still there, just waiting to be broken apart and tossed into a landfill. But on closer inspection, I find that the elegant brushstrokes of the nighttime woods suddenly end and are not present in the last third of the mural on the left side, where it was still blank and incomplete in Mike and Jenna's videos. Well, the paint is still there, as are the trees and dark colours of that ominous forest. But the subtle texture only the touch of human hands can create has been replaced by something mechanical. What was changed and then changed back is now an unfeeling reproduction that could never get right the true authenticity of real historical art, made by someone who cared.
Well, my dear friends, what did you think of that one? Oh, so that genuinely creeped me out. Oh, I had to stop reading a couple of times because it was just getting a bit too much for me. It doesn't happen very often, but I did in that one. Yeah, abandoned malls. Uh, Going to be a big place for ghosts and ghoulies in the uh, coming century, I think, when most of them have closed and gone, and only the remnants of them are left. Well, what am I talking about? Maybe it's nothing. Well, that was a biggie for your midweek entertainment. Hope you enjoyed that one. I'm going to be back again very soon. Probably with a podcast tomorrow night, and then who knows what. All right, till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams, and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.